It is now 1 a.m. and we are now starting. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tim Wee Presents. I am going to start work on a Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes mod. I have already created the manual. It is called Corners. For those of you who don't know what Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes is, let me just very quickly show you the uh, Steam page for this. This is a cooperative game in which user has to defuse a bomb, a bomb that might look something like this here. Uh, this bomb has several modules on it. Uh, there are modules on it, so on this screen, for example, you can see this uh, uh, module with some keys on it. Here are some keys, and here is a maze, and sometimes you have wires that you need to cut, or maybe a um, uh, Maybe a uh, uh, so here we have wires to cut, or maybe a password to enter, or maybe a big button to press at the right time relative to time. So this is the basic idea of the game. But um, in order to know exactly what keys to press, what wires to cut, what button, or when the button to press the button, you need the bomb manual, which is available on this website here. And this bomb manual has rules in it, such as, for example, if there are three wires and none of them is red, you cut the second wire. And there you have tons and tons of rules. And the twist then, of course, is that only one player, the diffuser, can see the bomb, and only the other players, the experts, can see the manual. Now, this game is moddable. You may have noticed that when I brought up this uh, first page here, this is the Steam Workshop, which has mods on it. Mods are content created by the community uh, for this game. And you can already see some really big bombs here with tons and tons of modules. And if I just look here, there are different modules made by people. Here is a Masu module, for example, which is a Japanese pen and paper puzzle turned into a bomb module. Uh, here is an example of a screenshot of a bomb that has like tons and tons of modules on it. All of these modules were created by members of the community. Uh, except, of course, for the 11 initial modules that are in the game, but none of these on the screenshot are base modules. Unless, of course, you count the timer, which uh, which is part of the base game. But uh, you know, every bomb needs a countdown timer. So obviously, so this is not the countdown timer. This is a module called Forget Me Not. But anyway, all right. So today we are going to create a new module, and I've already created a manual. The module is going to be called Corners, and um, the rules are actually very s simple. The module is going to have four colors in each corner. And they're going to be red, green, blue, or yellow. Uh, they, there can be repeats, so you could, for example, have all corners be yellow or something like that. So let's take that as an example. You have all four corners be yellow, which means that you'd be looking at these four squares. Then it tells you to look at the last digit of the serial number. Let's say for this example, the last digit is a three. Uh, so you, you would have to start here. And now I have to find a path through this maze that starts here and visits all the other three spaces. And of course, there are several different ways. For example, you could, I'm going to mark the path in red. For example, you could go up here, then to the right, and then down, and then visit the seven. Or you could, no, you, turning right here would be nonsense because this is a dead end. But you could go down and then right, and then up to visit the seven. And you have to find out which path is the shortest, and then click the corners in the right order according to the shortest path. Now, in this situation, I strongly suspect the five will have to be last because the only way to go to get out of the five is to go back to the three where we started. So I suspect that the fastest path is going to be turn right here, take the seven, turn back right here, and then go down here and then pick, pick the seven, go down, then pick the five. So the answer then would be bottom right, bottom left, top right. Sorry, you'd start with the top left because that's your starting square, right? So your solution, which I'll mark in green, is first press this one, and then we went to uh, then we went to this one, and then this one, and then this one. Okay, let's take a look at what you have to say. Can we new module? I hear audience participation right as Twitch decides to buffer. Fantastic. I'm so sorry, Blananas. That is unfortunate. Um, okay. Um, 
Oh boy, this looks entertaining. I'm, I hope that I will be able to deliver on that promise, Crazy Caleb. Let's find out if I can. So, now I've already created myself a little folder in my Catane development things called Corners, and it has everything that we need. I'm going to open the module here in Unity, and as you can see, we already have a blank module. Now, I'm going to make a few changes to this. First of all, my plan is to have the status light be in the middle of the module so that all four corners will basically look the same. Now, fortunately, I already have a um, model which has all four corners, you know, without the status light, and I used it in Simon Spins, which is a different uh, module that I made some other time. Uh, let's take a quick look at this. And this is the workshop page for Simon Spins. As you can see, the module has all four corners sort of big, and the, the, the status light is in the middle of the module. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's go to my um, uh, Simon Spins folder. Inside the assets folder, I'm going to have a models folder, and this one is going to have a model component .obj. I'm just going to blindly copy this into my uh, corners folder. Um, but actually, before I do that, I'm going to do something else because I just realized that I haven't actually made this folder a Git repository yet. So I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to open it right here in my uh, source tree, uh, which is the program that I use to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to handle Git repositories. It has all of the files in it, as you can see, all the test harness and all of the uh, KM scripts from the Kitane mod kit. So I'm going to click Stage All. And from then on, we will be able to see exactly what changes we made, and we'll be able to revert them. So now if I do this copy command, interesting, it did not actually ask me to overwrite the file, which suggests that I put it in the wrong folder. And I did, I forgot to put it inside of models. You will notice there is already a model component.org. So I'm going to tell Windows to overwrite this file. And you can now see in source tree, that this file appears. And as you can see, there are some changes to the file. Let's see in Unity what those changes look like. Now you will notice the status light appears like it's still there, but actually, if you like turn this to the side, you will notice that it's actually just the texture on it. So it's just a sort of flat picture of it. And this is because the texture file obviously has the graphics for the sta status light socket in it. So when I made Simon Spins, I had to change that as well. So let's go back to the Simon Spins, which probably has a textures folder. And uh, apart from all of the symbols used by Simon Spins, it has the component background PNG. So I'm going to copy that into corners, assets, textures. Okay, there's no textures folder. Let's find out where the texture actually is. It's probably in MISC. There you go, component background. Because most modules I make don't use many textures, so I called the folder MISC for miscellaneous because it's gonna usually contain only one uh, file anyway. So, you know, one file, one texture file, one preview image file, maybe one sound file, maybe one font file, you know, you, it's it's a bit annoying to have separate folders for all of these. So I would put them into MISC and only turn it into a separate textures folder once I have too many textures. All right. So now we have a module without the status light socket. And um, I, I will readily grant that I didn't actually show you how I made that because I literally just copied it from Simon Spins. But hey, you can do that too because Simon Spins exists and it's open source. You can get these files from the GitHub repo. So if you wanted to create a module with the status light in a different place, you can do that too. Okay, so now the status light position is actually dictated by this object here called status light. I'm just quickly going to change the uh, x and z coordinate to zero, which will put the status light in the middle. Uh, the, the, you can't see the status light here, but the, the game obviously will put the status light in this position. Now I'm going to lower this to be on the same level as the top of the module. Uh, I believe that top of the module to be approximately, oh yeah, I see this is a bit too high. I thought it was 0 0.015. So um, yeah, that looks about right, as you can see. Yeah, I'm just going to put it at 0.0. Mm. Let me quickly check this. 
that, yeah, that, that seems to match up with that. So I'm going to leave it at that coordinate. Let's press apply to save the prefab. And apparently we have a compiler error in the source file. That is not unexpected because the source file contains some uh, uh, placeholders. So let's take a quick look at the source file. I can open uh, the source file from Unity directly by just double clicking this file. And it will open Visual Studio. I don't need the other copy of Visual Studio then because I, I had Visual Studio open, but Unity is just starting a new one. And then once that has loaded, we can see that I put module ID in uh, angle brackets here. So I want this to be called corners and on the subject of corners. There we go. So it has some uh, basic scaffolding here. It has the module ID, which will count uh, multiple instances of the same module on the same bomb so that the logging can be distinguished. Um, and basically nothing else. Um, we are going to have to create everything else. Uh, so once this recompiles, the error message disappears, and we now have these three fields here, which correspond to these declarations, the KM bomb info, KM bomb module, KM audio. So I'm just going to quickly put the corners module into all three of these. There you go. All right. Now the next thing that I want to be able to do is I want to be able to color the clamps on the module because all this time I've been talking about the corners of the module but what I really mean by the corners is I mean the clamps and in order to be able to color all four of them separately I'm going to uh, split th these clamps off into a separate um, what's it called a model so we will actually have four separate objects one for each corner and another fifth object for the rest of the module. Now, before I get into that, let me very quickly take a look at the texture file. If we go to uh, contain corners, assets, textures, uh, yeah, that's right, I put it in MISC, that's why. So you will notice in the texture file, there's actually only one piece of uh, texturing for the clamps. This is fortunate because this means that we can actually, we only need to create one model for one of the corners and then the other four can literally just be uh, rotations of it, rotations about the center of the module. So I'm just going to delete the other three clamps and move uh, the first clamp into a separate object file by itself. So how do we do this? Now, ordinarily, 3D modelers would do this with Blender. But I've tried Blender and I hate it, and I'm not going to use it. Instead, I'm going to make my life as difficult as possible by using a primitive program that I have created at some point called MeshEdit. And now you will notice that it shows a uh, module that I've been working on at some point in the past. I recognize this. This is actually, in fact, I'm going to um, pose this as a poser to you guys. Can you guys recognize what module this is? And, uh, when, you know, I was working on the model for a module. And testing is the first to give the right answer. It is, in fact, Arithmologic. I recreated the visuals for Arithmologic. The module was originally made by, by um, I don't want to give the wrong name. I believe it was... Uh, Oh, there you go. It was Jerry Eris. That's right. And I asked him, hey, Jerry Eris, I really like your module. I really like the mechanics of it, the logic of it. But uh, visually, it looked a little uh, primitive because it was made of cubes. So I said, look, I'll go in and make this. All right. So now that we finally have this program, we are going to, oh, look at this. I'm actually still in the arithmologic uh, folder here. But we're going to go to corners now, assets, uh, models. Here is our model. OK, so I want to create a copy of this. And one of the copies is going to contain a module without the clamp. And the other copy is going to contain just the clamp. So let's go to our uh, models folder here, take a copy of this, and call it clamp. OK. So our model component will have everything but the clamps. So I'm going to have to, um, I don't remember the key bindings for my own program, but that's OK. I can actually just uh, go to the, um, uh, the actual file, model component. So you will notice that some of these uh, um, 
tri triangles or pol polygons, that's the term, are red and some of them are gray. Uh, the way I've made it, I've made them red so that the, this program will ignore them. So if I try to select some of these, you will notice it will select only vertices that belong to the gray uh, things. And if I press F to select faces, you will notice it will select only the faces that are not red. So the way that it saves this is by having this little line on the bottom. So I can just delete that line and then reopen the file and you'll notice that it will now all go gray. Uh, except that, oh, there we go, it did. So now I can freely select these um, uh, clamps and remove them. So if I just press delete, that should get rid of them. And uh, now we have a module without the clamps. This is, by the way, this is the first time I'm doing this. This is the first time I'm really taking a module apart. I mean, I have edited a module before, as you saw with Simon Spins. I have, uh, you know, I have modified the clamps in the top right to look more like the ones on the left. But I have never actually removed the clamps. Okay, so now I'll save this file and I'll go back to Unity and bang, the clamps are gone. Uh, holy camoly. So that was relatively easy. So now I'm going to open the clamp.opt file and I'm going to uh, remove everything but the clamps. So let's open this clamp object file, remove this H line at the bottom, reopen this. There we go. And now I'm going to delete everything that isn't the top left clamps because as we discovered, we actually only need the top left um, because uh, for the others, we can just make them rotations of the top left ones. And here we go. Yeah, I don't need that either. So here we go. Now we've got the two clamps. I'm going to save that. And now in Unity, I can easily, 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 easily just create an empty object with a mesh renderer and a mesh filter, which is how you do 3D objects. So let's choose the clamp. Apparently it has not, ooh, I know why it's not in the list. Let's close this file, this program, because we don't need that anymore. You see, when I copied the files, the, I copied model component.org into clamp.org, I didn't change this. So I'm going to change this, and I bet that there is another copy of that. There you go. All right, let's change both of those. And now Unity will let me choose the word clamp. There we go. So now we have that and we need a uh, material, I guess. Uh, I'm going to give it the exact same material that the uh, module background has. Boink. All right, now let's find out why it isn't showing up. Because it should be. Um, maybe it's because if I look at the uh, model, you may notice that this one here has a scale factor of 0 0.1. This means that you know, it's actually ten, a tenth of the size that it should be. So the clamp thing, because it's new, doesn't have that yet. So if I change that to 0.1 and press apply, I'm willing to bet that the clamp appears, and it does. Uh, now, there are some other options here, which, uh, you know, I, I want these to, uh, to match, because uh, I, I don't know what they do, but I want the clamp to look and behave exactly like the module, so I'm just going to set Oh, that was the wrong one. I want to set these to off. All right, are there any other differences? Let's uh, see. Okay, it looks like right, this is grayed out, so it's probably um, uh, unimportant. Let's scroll to the bottom and see some differences here. Yep, okay, I'm, I'm going to leave it at this. Okay. Now, you may be wondering why did the clamp appear in the bottom right? instead of the top left, because it was in the top left in the mesh edit. Well, if we look at the component background object here, you will notice that it's actually rotated 180 degrees uh, across, along the y-axis. Um, I am not quite sure why the Kitane mod kit does this, but it does. And every module in existence that I'm aware of has uh, gotten with it, has run with it. Except perhaps for third base and other modules that are actually upside down, um, but regardless, we're going to keep it because this is how uh, we're used to it. All right, so we've got our clamp and this is the uh, bottom right clamp. So let's take four copies of this and make this the bottom left, make this the top left and this the top right. So they are in clockwise order. So if I rotate this 90 degrees, it will go here. 
uh, 90 degrees again is 180 and then 270 bingo and they're now all in the right place apply now we're going to create uh, actually no we don't even need to create a separate um, uh, yeah, that's right. We're just going to change the material for this matte background. And instead of mobile diffuse, we're going to use um, uh, Katane um, mobile diffuse tint. All right? It will look marginally different. I don't know if you noticed this. It's kind of, it kind of flickered here. But, um, you know, on first sight, you wouldn't notice the difference. But the cool thing that we can do now is we can change the colors. So if I change this, for example, to red, it will go red. Now, obviously, all of them go red because I'm modifying the one material that is used by all five objects. But if I do this in the code, then Unity will helpfully create little copies for me. And, um, and then I will be able to change them in code uh, independently of each other. All right, so let's take a quick look at the source code for the corners module. All right, let's see what you guys have to say. Um, oh, it said the name and the title, I see. Um, that might explain it. Doesn't divided squares not have clamps? It does have clamps. It does have clamps. I'm pretty sure that divided squares has the clamps, just not the um, yeah, it still has the clamps, just not the status light. So that's an interesting point because that um, might mean that so divided squares was published in October 2018 and spins was made later in December, which means that I didn't actually create that model for Simon Spins, I created it for divided squares, and then I reused it in Simon Spins. It's amazing how much of this I've already forgotten, because I haven't done modding for so long. All right, let's go back to the source code. So what we want is we want a separate material variable for the clamps. So for example, you know, actually, no, we don't need to save them because we only need to set the materials once uh, at the start. So actually, I'm just going to have a material array with the uh, corner colors, uh, which isn't actually a material array, it's a color array. There we go. All right, now let's design ourselves the colors. So we're going to... Uh, I am actually, you know, just to make... Uh, just to see what it will look like. I'm actually going to take a copy of this, so clamp material. Um, and I'm going to change one of these to that material. So let's put matte clamp in here, uh, apply, save. And now if I change the color, it will change only the bottom right clamp. All right, so the red color, now this would be a bit very sort of, you know, uh, massive red, if you see what I mean. That's not really what we wanted, what we want. Uh, so I'm going to make it like, I'm a bit annoyed that I can't make it more, uh, uh, you know, lighter. I, I can do this, but, you know, then it becomes less red. So I think I'm going to do this. This, this looks about, this, this looks like reddishly tinted metal. So I'm, I'm kind of happy with this color. Let's see what it looks like if it were, yeah, that's already too dark. So let's, let's actually keep this color. Um, so that would be the red color. So I'm going to keep them in the order uh, red, green, blue, yellow, which is how they are uh, listed in the manual. So let's press apply so I don't lose that. Uh, in case it crashes, then we have green as the next color. So let's change the hue to green, 128. All right, so I think I want that to be a bit less intense. So it should still kind of look like metallic here, but not too saturated. So maybe about here. I think that looks like a perfectly chrominant green. So let's put that in here. That's our, oops, that's our green that we want. Let's apply and save. The next color we want to look at is blue. Now with blue, if you do the sort of purest blue like this, it will always turn out pretty dark because blue is just a fundamentally dark uh, dimension in, in the color space. So I tend to make it sort of slightly in the direction of uh, cyan-ish, uh, which actually makes it look kind of grayish now in comparison to the module because the module is perceived to be gray, but the module background is actually itself a slight tint of blue, 
with uh, very low saturation, so it looks uh, gray, but not completely zero saturation, so it's not actual gray. I'm happy to show you what it looks like when it's actual gray, but um, for now, let's, uh, let's uh, change this to something that looks like bluish metal. I think that can be a bit lighter. Yeah, I think I'm happy with this kind of color. So I'm going to set the blue color to this. Let's go here, change that, change that and apply. See, now if you see these three colors in contrast, it looks very blue here. All right, let's um, change the color to yellow now. Yellow would be 64. Um, and this one should really be bright, maybe not super saturated, but definitely bright. Because if you had yellow metal, it would be bright. So I think I want this at uh, like kind of this kind of brightness. This kind of saturation is what I meant, because I'm already at maximum brightness. Okay, so I'm going to copy this. Wait a second, why? Maybe 66 was a better? No. Maybe 60, ah, 60 is actual yellow. Uh, there we go, that's, that's actually better. Okay, let's change this to yellow. And now we have our colors. Uh, at which point I'm now going to change this clamp back to a uh, material background and delete the other material that I created. Um, let's take a look at what you guys have to say. Uh, divided squares has clamps, indeed. Um, faulty sync, are you telling me that faulty sync doesn't have clamps? I want to see that if that is the case. Uh, no, it does have clamps. I'm not quite sure pink module when. <laughs> we could have a pink module. Backgrounds isn't really pink, it's magenta, which is uh, notably different. Uh, in fact, you can see backgrounds right here. That's not really pink, right? Really pink is really pink. Uh, besides backgrounds, if you look at the um, screenshot up close, uh, it, okay, it does use the texture, but it, it kind of washes out the texture if you see what I mean. So that the sort of metallic strokes on it are kind of less uh, visible here. I can't unsee the blue in the background anymore. Anymore, uh, the blue in the background. Hmm. I'm I'm afraid I've lost the context to that one. Bamboozling corners. Top left is lime. Top right is rose. I think or magenta. <laughs> That's funny. Cruel corners. Uh, please do not make a cruel version of this module because. Um, having too many colors that are too difficult to distinguish is a very cheap way of making a module crueler. And it does not really add much gameplay. All right, the blue in the module background. Um, oh, I see, you mean the blue tint of the thing that's supposed to be gray. Okay, I get it. All right, let's, um, uh, let's move this back to the middle. And, uh, all right, let's um, have a module. Okay, so now we're going to write some code that is going to make the colors of the clamps random. Let's apply and save. Okay, so here is our source code. So we've got our colors, and we're going to decide on some colors. So um, var uh, clamp colors uh, equals new. So we're gonna have four corners, right? And each of these clamp colors zero is going to have a uh, random value, which is rnd.range, uh, between zero and three. Remember the second bound here is exclusive. So each of these is going to have a random color. And then I'm going to say that for each of these, I'm going to say the clamp, which I forgot to add. We need the, uh, um, the mesh renderer, I guess is what we need. Uh, we put the clamps in here. And then that clamp's material color is equal to the corner color um, of clamp colors i. Okay, so let's quickly put the um, the clamp models in here, and I want to sort them from the top left, going clockwise. So uh, this is the order in which I will put them bottom right and then bottom left. And then while I'm at it, I can also reorder them in here. So they're in the same order. 
There you go, top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. That is clockwise order. Lol, imagine actually learning bamboozling modules. <laughs> uh, you don't know things. I do know things. Um, <laughs> every Simon variant is a cruel version of Simon. I would argue that some Simon variants, such as um, Simon Sins and uh, Simon, uh, you know, some of them aren't very Simony. I think Simon Sins has uh, pretty widely been criticized for not having the characteristic of a Simon module anymore. Um, I can't still get over the fact how FTA colors. It's very different from bamboozlings. Right. Color standard. <laughs> well, uh, the colors, the, the best way to have a colored standard is for every colored module to have a uh, colorblind mode. So you can have letters on the modules. And uh, that's the best way to solve this problem. So um, if I now run this code, Let's run this code and see if the corners... There we go. We now have green, yellow, green, green. Let's try this again. Let's also turn off the uh, Twitch Play support in the test harness. That's actually kind of in the way right now. Am I not seeing it? There we go. Twitch Play active. Let's say no. And let's run this. And now which, without Twitch Play, we can actually see the status light in the middle of the module. And here we go. We have red, yellow, green, blue. Okay. So now we have the colors of the corners, the corner colors, color, corner, corner colors. There should be a color standard. I'm going to close this now because we don't need that anymore. The next thing we need is we need the corners to be clickable. Now, um, I could, in theory, add a KM selectable to the clamps, but I don't want to do that because the clamps are dangerously close to modules that are adjacent. So I'm actually going to make touchable areas in the corners of the module and I'm going to shape them in a way very similar to this. You know, I want them to kind of look like this. So this is what I'm going to do. So we are going to create a little model that has this shape. And as crazy as it may seem, I am going to write this model file by hand. So if you've all always wondered how these obj files work, like what, do, what does this even mean, I am going to show that to you now. So I'm going to create a model called um, a clickable area, I guess. Yeah, I'm going to call it that. Dot obj. There you go. So I'm going to change this to clickable area. I'm going to change this to clickable area. Okay, so the first section here, the ones that start with V, are the vertex, ver vertexes, vertices, the vertices of every uh, surface, every polygon in your model. As you can see, each of them have three numbers, one, two, three, which is the X, Y, and Z coordinates. So they're, you know, three-dimensional vertices. So for our purposes, we are going to need one, two, three, four vertices, right? We need the two in the corner and the two sort of off the corner. So the one in the corner, I'm just going to um, say is minus one, zero, minus one. The Y coordinate is the one that points away from the module. So it's actually X and Z that we are concerned about when it comes to the surface of the module. All right. Now, why am I so sure that one is fine? It's not actually because I saw 0.9 here. It's because you can scale these any way you want. So you can just pretend that the space on the module goes from negative one to one, and that makes it much easier to think about this. Um, and, uh, and then you can just scale it to fit the module. So let's do that. All right. So another vertex is going to be the one on the right here. So since it's probably going to extend to the middle, I'm going to put 0, 0, minus 1 there. Now you might be thinking, as I point the mouse here to the point where this ends, this is obviously not in the middle. Well, I did that in the manual to make it more visible, to make it sort of thicker so that it, it doesn't sort of disappear into the frame. But I can't do that on the module because I don't want them to overlap with each other. On the manual, they're not going to overlap, so I can do that here. But on the module, I don't want them to overlap, so I'm going to have them go exactly to the middle. Right, then the next vertex is going to be the one here that is kind of off corner. So I'm just going to wing it and say 0.9 for now. And uh, it's probably 
uh, going to get changed later. And then finally, the next vertex we need that we need is the one on the left side, which again the x coordinate is uh, negative one, and now the y coordinate, uh, the y coordinate is zero, which is in the middle of the module. That's right. Now. Uh, the T in VT stands for texture. You will notice that all of these are two numbers, so these are just uh, two coordinates, but these are not X and Y coordinates, these are U and V coordinates. If you know how textures work, then you already know everything you need to know. But we don't care about textures right now because we're not going to put a texture on the corner, you know, because this is just a highlight that will only appear when you hover over it, so it doesn't even need a texture, so we can grow with it. Uh, normal vectors are vectors that um, tell you which direction a face is going to face. So whether it faces away from you or towards you or to your side, it, um, you know, if you have something with a rounded corner, then you need the normal vector for the shading to look right, for the, for the light to bounce, bounce off the rounding in such a way that it actually looks round. Uh, we technically don't need that, but since we're going to have only one normal vector anyway, I'm just going to put that in. Okay, so now we have our four vertices. So the last thing, obviously, is the faces, which is basically the triangles that this model is going to consist of. We are going to need only two triangles. Right? And uh, each of these, uh, so you can have any number of, uh, uh, of these sort of number pairs. Each face can have any number of vertices, but we are going to uh, construct this out of two triangles because Unity sometimes runs into trouble if the face is not convex, and obviously the shape is not convex. So I'm going to subdivide it into two triangles. All right, in each of these number pairs, the first one is the index of the vertex. The second one is the index of the texture. We don't have texture, so we're just going to omit that. And the third one is the normal vector, which in our purpose is always going to be one because we have only one normal vector. All right, with that said, uh, our first triangle is just going to be uh, the first three vertices in clockwise order. And then the second one is going to be the first vertex, which is in the top left corner, uh, followed by the uh, third vertex, which is the one that is sort of just off corner followed by the fourth vertex, which is the one on the left. All right, now let's get rid of these uh, empty lines, save the file, and watch it all go wrong. We are now going to create something with a mesh filter and a mesh renderer. Now the material I want to use here is the uh, highlight overlay material, which comes from the test harness. This only exists to let you see the highlights in the test harness. So this is not actually going to be part of the module, uh, but we have it here in, the, in Unity, so we can use it to test. Uh, for 11, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. That needs to be a double slash. Thank you very much. That is uh, great that you noticed that. Oh, <laughs> maybe there was even an error message there. I didn't notice, and I just saw it disappear. That's fine. All right, so here we can now have our um, clickable area, which is right here. You can already kind of see here in the preview that it, it looks about right. But if I um, do, uh, let's do this. If I click here, I can actually have a preview. And th this, this, this actually allows me to see what it looks like. All right, so I am kind of doing it right, I guess. But as you can see, it's not showing up in the module. So I guess I'm going to have to, uh, do something. Well, first of all, we are going to need our um, scaling. So I'm just going to use the point 0.1 scaling. Aha! It has become visible. Okay. So um, let's call this clickable area bottom right. Um, so the reason it seems to be sort of partly gone is because it's reaching into the module. Remember the uh, uh, Y coordinate of the surface of the module was something like 0.015. All right, and now you can see that it reaches uh, further than the module. So I'm actually just going to change the scale factor here to maybe 0.8. There we go. And now it fits on the module. And now you will see that it does this sort of flashing kind of weird thing. This is called Z-fighting. And this happens when your polygon is exactly 
uh, covering exactly in the same place as another polygon. So in this case, the surface that we've just created is in exactly the same place as the surface of the module. And so the two sort of compete for which one is above the other. And, you know, because calculations in computers are always slightly inaccurate, there's always a rounding error. And that's because it sort of keeps going back and forth as you change the camera angle. It's because the rounding error is essentially random. So we're going to move it just very slightly up to uh, 0 0.01501 and we're going to press apply and now we have our clickable area and it's visible. All right, will the clickable area be colored the same as the clamp? No, it will only consist of the highlight. Uh, I am actually going to make the module basically blank uh, and once you hover over it, you will see these uh, this as, as a highlight. All right. Now, I think the highlight could be slightly thicker. So I think the uh, coordinate that is off the corner, let's actually change that to 0.8. And uh, that is a bit thick. Uh, so I want something in between. Let's take a look at what I actually did in the uh, manual. Uh, in the manual, um, let's, uh, there you go. Let's make a readable font size. Um, I created the SVG somewhere here. So this, uh, yeah, I believe this is it. Okay, so this is in a uh, range of coordinates that goes from negative 5 to 5 instead of negative 1 to 1. So in our heads, we're going to have to pretend that it's, um, uh, you know, a fifth of what it is. Um, so let me try and figure out why it says 2 here. Um... I would have expected it to, to be at negative 5, negative 5, obviously. Um, anyway, so this one here is pretty clearly the... Oh, I see this is 2 because... The reason this is 2 is because it starts with the top right corner, so I, I think. Uh, or bottom left, maybe it's bottom left. I, I really need to research this. Um, okay, so clearly it's negative 4, which is 1 fifth or 4 fifths, so that would be 0 0.8. So the reason this looks thicker than it does in the manual, even though both of them are 0 0.8, is because this one here, uh, the lines are longer. You know, the lines don't uh, go only to the middle. So I'm actually going to uh, change it to 0 0.8 to 5, maybe. Uh, maybe a little more, 0 0.83, whoops. Yeah. This looks approximately the kind of thickness that I want. Let's see what you guys have to say. Make it negative 69. All right. Will the clickable area become... No, I'm worried about corners being next to something like a soft divided square that cast light on surrounding modules. I don't think such a casting light will change the colors too dramatically. Um, I'm, you know, I could be proven wrong, in which case maybe, you know, maybe I'll make the colors more saturated or whatever. But I, I really don't think it's going to be a problem. And besides, even if it is a problem, then I could argue in some sense that it's part of the strategy uh, not to solve divided squares before you've at least obtained the colors for the corners. But anyway, I still don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, of course, I'm going to have a uh, colorblind mode in uh, eventually in the end. So if, if all else fails, I suppose you can always have a colorblind mode. And of course, on TP, you can always just um, in enable the colorblind mode with a command. So anyway, so let's get back to work. So we've got our clickable area bottom right. We are going to... Um, we need to change this because this is the highlight and we want the KM selectable. Um, uh, yeah, we need a KM selectable for you to be able to click, and then this will be the highlight of the selectable. So I'm going to create another empty thing, and I'm going to call this the highlight, and this the actual clickable area. And this one will have a KM selectable uh, component. The parent is going to be the corners module, and this. I'm going to disable the mesh render so we don't see it. It's going to be a KM highlightable. Um, uh, this, the outline, the scale should be one, so because we've already decided on the scale, so that's what that should be. Uh, and then this can have the highlight as its highlight. 
And I'm also going to put the highlight under it like this. All right. Um, so that's pretty good. What else does this need? This needs a collider because um, Unity, or rather the game, needs to know where you can hover you know, f for this. So I'm going to create a box collider and it's going to be... Um, okay, so if I do this, the box will be in the middle of the module, obviously. And I want it off to the side. So let's, um, let's also press apply because I've made some significant changes to the hierarchy. All right, so the Y size can be very small because it's... Uh, um, oh, you can still see it, but ah, I see, of course, I need to move it up to the surface of the module, which is 0.015. There you go. All right, so if the module has a size of approximately 1, I think it was like 0.8 in both directions. It's actually 1.6, but it's 0.8 from the zero point. Uh, it means that I need to move it half that, so maybe 0.4. Um, OK, that, that completely disappeared. Let me find out why. If I move it manually, huh, all right. 0.04. All right. Okay. Let's do that then. Um, okay. I think this this is actually already acceptable. No, it's not because it overlaps. Uh, you know, if we had another one here, it would overlap that, and we we can't have that. We have to have them side by side. But I'm going to address that address address that afterwards. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to have uh, four copies of it. Two, three, four. Um, I also kind of want to make sure whether this is actually the bottom right. Um, all right, the camera is correct, so that it's actually in the top right. Um, <laughs> all right, then. Let's call that the top right, I guess. All right, and then we rotate this one 90 degrees. Um, oh, 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 oh. Ah, I should not have uh, moved the object. I should have moved only the um, uh, box collider because when I do the rotation, I still want the rotation to be about the center of the module, right? Because I've moved the module, When if I now do a rotation here, you will see that it rotates about the center of that box. And really, I should have done this for the demonstration. There you go, right? It'll, send, it'll center the rotation about the, you know, the center of the box. Uh, but I want it centered about the module. So I'm going to move the box collider by the same amount that I've used, move, moved this and then move this back. Now, if I change the Y rotation, you will notice that it actually goes into the other corner. All right, this is what we want. Change that back to zero, apply, and now let's make our four copies. One, two, three, four. This is now going to be the bottom right. Uh, and of course, the highlight is going to be the bottom right highlight. And we just rotate that 90 degrees. And this is going to be the bottom left, obviously. Bottom left, here we go. And this is going to have a 180 degrees rotation. This is going to be the uh, top left, which is going to have a 270 rotation. And this is the top left highlight. All right. With that in place, I can now select all four. And now I can clearly see the amount of overlap. And now if I change the numbers here to like 0.09 or something, I can immediately see like what number I need to put in. It turns out it's 0.08 to make sure that they don't overlap. However, I'm actually going to increase this a little because I want it I want it to stretch all the way to the corners of the module. You will notice that it doesn't quite reach to the corners. So I'm actually going to change it to this and then move it a little further. This is closer to what I wanted. So this is what I'm going to keep. Let's press apply. We are now going to add the four uh, objects here to the children array which I can do by just uh, doing this. But this time, the order needs to be different because I need this to be uh, gamepad uh, compatible. I want a child row of length. So now I want it in reading order. So now I actually want the top left first, then the top right, then the bottom left, and then the bottom right. All right, let's uh, apply and save that. Now, if I run this, I hope that the... Uh, 
Bingo, they already show up. There you go. So that worked. So they are now clickable areas. And as you can see, you know, actually it just occurred to me that because the places that you can put the mouse are determined by the box uh, collider and not by the shape of the highlight, we can actually make the highlight reach beyond the middle of the module. So let's actually do that after all. Um, let's actually use the same numbers that we used in the, uh, in the manual. All right. So now let me very quickly figure out why this says 2 and not uh, negative 5. Right, here is why. It's because, uh, imagine you have your uh, uh, coordinate system like this. Right, so this is the box that we're operating in, and the coordinate here is negative 5, and here is 5. And in the Y space, of course, this is negative 5, and this is 5. Then the midpoint is going to be at 0, obviously. Right? So 2 is actually slightly below that. So this is the first coordinate that it, uh, it uh, starts in. And then the next thing it does, it, it goes up vertically, negative 7 which takes it exactly to this place here, which is, of course, negative 5, negative 5. I'm just going to put an X there now, right? And then, uh, whoops, and then the next thing it does is to go horizontal 7, a uh, positive 7, which takes it to this coordinate, which is, of course, uh, you know, 2 in X space, if you see what I mean, right? And then the last coordinate I decided to write as an absolute coordinate, negative 4, negative 4. So this is why it says 2. Okay, so if we divide all of these numbers by 5, um, right, so the coordinates would actually be, the coordinates would actually be, be negative 5, 2, and then uh, negative 5, negative 5, and then it would be 2, negative 5, and then negative 4, negative 4. Now let's divide all of this by 5. So this is 1, this is 0.4. I'm going to put some separation here. This is 1, uh, this is 1. Uh, this would be uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, and this is negative 1, and then this is uh, 0 0.8. Okay, and now we're going to use these exact numbers in here, right? There we go. We can just unindent this, put a V there, and then put the uh, 0 coordinate in here. Uh, let me make sure that I put them in the right order. I did not, of course. Right, you know what, I'm going to just, just write these lines again, because now that I know what order they're in, uh, this is good. All right, so I can do this. I can uh, replace uh, duplicated spaces. Um, so now that we know that the uh, first coordinate is the bottom left, it means that 1 and 2 is the left edge, and then the third one for that triangle needs to be the thing that is off corner, which is number 4. And then the other triangle starts in the top left corner, uh, goes to the right, which is number 3, and so this should be correct. So uh, let's go back to Unity. And let's run this module again, and it'll probably look pretty much the same, except that... ooh. Aha! All right, it does this flickering where it's not sure which one I'm hovering over. Why is this happening? We gave it a, um, a box collider which didn't overlap. Well, the reason this is happening is because when we uh, defined the box collider, we didn't tell Katane to use it. You'll see here selectable colliders has the length zeros. So we didn't put the collider object in there. Um, when this is size zero, the game uh, will generate its own collider. In fact, before I fix this, I'm going to show you this, right? If I um, look at the hierarchy while the module is running, you can see that the highlight now has a child of its own, and this highlight has a box collider. I thought it did. Maybe it doesn't. Okay, so I was wrong. It doesn't actually generate a box collider like I thought it did, but what, what I'm explaining is still true, which is that the extent of the highlight uh, mesh, as in the shape that we just created, defines the clickable area. All right, so we'll fix this in the way that I said, which is that the um, selectable colliders array needs to have a reference to this. It could actually be a reference to any object, but because we put the collide... Ooh. Oh, I see, this is locked, that's why. Um, which means that we put the selectable collider on the module as... <laughs> 
That's not what I wanted. We want it here. Okay, then the bottom right. So you could actually put the collider on a different object and then put that object in this array. Um, but I've never done that. I've never needed to do that. Uh, so now if I do it, this flickering should no longer occur. Ladies and gentlemen, there you go. Okay, and now we can see that I assigned the wrong colliders. See, while my mouse is in the top right, it shows me the bottom right. Um, oh, no, no, no. The reason this is happening is because we... That's right, we changed the geometry of this, right? Because uh, initially I said I wanted to start in the top right and go clockwise, but now I'm starting in the top left and going clockwise. So they're all off by one. And I inadvertently moved it uh, one clockwise. Right, so the way I'm going to fix this is I'm going to change the... Uh, um, God damn it. Ah, uh, this is annoying. You know what? I'm actually just going to change the coordinates here. I'm going to... Uh... No, 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 no. The easiest thing to do is to actually just rotate the highlights. I'm sorry about this. This is a bit unprofessional, but uh, literally this is the easiest fix. Uh, it's probably going to be negative 90, isn't it? Yep, that's wrong now. <laughs> Let's change that to negative 90. Okay, so that is once again correct. Now, to make absolutely sure that the selectables are correct, I'm going to start writing some code that will output a log message uh, when you click on it. So now, we are going to need an array of came selectables for the uh, clickable corners. I'm just going to call that corners. All right, um, and then corners i on click, on, on what was it? On interact is what it's called. Um, corner click handler i. Let's do that, generate that method, return the delegate. The delegate needs to return false and uh, output a log message. So here's our first log message for the module corners. And uh, you clicked corner one. All right, so we want the module ID and we are going to have names for the corners. I believe that the first one is top left, then top right, then bottom right, and then bottom left. And I want the ith element. All right, let's run that. So now it should tell me which color, which which corner I pressed. But there is a chance that I messed up. All right, I forgot to uh, populate the array here. Obviously, here the corners thing. All right, so let's lock this, uh, collapse these four and put all four of them in. I want top left to be number zero. Aha, see here we can actually see that I confused the orders. And now I'm starting in the top left and going clockwise. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to stick to that order from now on. All right. So now, bingo, that's the top left. That's the top right. That's the bottom right. That's the bottom left. OK. So that raises the question then, what order did I use in the manual? Because if this is, um, you know, if this is, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, this is the top left corner and I'm rotating it by 90 degrees times the number of the corner, which means that the top left corner is zero. Okay, so I am now using the same ordering as in the manual, which is good because I'm going to need to copy the um, algorithm from the manual. So let me uh, reveal to you that this manual is already rule seed supported and this uh, graph that you see on the uh, man manual, uh, I didn't actually create this by hand. I wrote an algorithm that generates it. All right, so if I change the numbers here, you will notice that not only the colors and the corners change, but also the arrows. In other words, the structure here changes. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you how the algorithm works that generates this and how I made sure that the um, uh, that, that every, uh, every one of the squares in the structure is... <laughs> then we use as an algorithm. Yeah, well, I want to make sure that every... Uh, node is reachable from every other node, and I'm going to show you how I made sure of that. So let's say we have a 4x4 four four, um, uh, grid, right? So I'm just going to make this 40 by 40. There we go. And I'm going to draw, I'm, I'm actually going to draw some lines here. You'll see why in a second. So I'm going to put one, two, three, four lines here. One, two, three. 
two, three, four, five lines of them, rows of them rather, and then we have this. Make one, two, three, four copies of that, and then one, two, three, four, five copies of that. Okay, so these are kind of like walls in a maze. So basically, we actually, I'm, I guess I can just tell you that now, we're actually um, going to go through a maze generation algorithm, but then I'll also explain to you how I uh, uh, adapted the maze generation algorithm for my purposes. So let's start out with um, all of the squares in a sort of, um, uh, let's, let's make it a reddish color. So red are the squares that the algorithm has not yet uh, considered. All right, so we're going to make all of these uh, red. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, three, four. And now let's select all of these and move them to the bottom so we can still see the walls. All right, I'm going to save this just in case, you know, something crashes. So yeah, let's replace that file. Okay, so here's how the algorithm works. This is a basic maze generation algorithm. So I'll work, walk, walk you through the, the, the sort of basic uh, maze generation idea first. Step number one, pick a square, any square at random. I'm going to say we pick this one, make it yellow, all right? So we now have a yellow square, red, that's cool. All right, and now we enter a loop. Pick a yellow square, any yellow square. Oh, look, there's only one. All right, let's pick that one. Uh, pick a wall, any wall, like any one of the four sides at random. All right, um, let's pick the one on the top. All right, so what we do now is we remove the wall and make the new square yellow. Next step, pick any yellow square, any yellow square. Right, it could pick this one, it could pick that one. Right, let's say it picks this one. Pick a wall, any wall. Well, this square has only two walls that we are allowed to remove, so it'll pick between those two. So let's say we pick this one, all right? So that uh, becomes a non-wall and we can go left. Next, pick a wall, any wall. All right, sorry, pick a, a yellow square, any yellow square. All right, let's say we pick this one again, and now there is only one wall to choose from, so we choose that wall. All right, so we delete that and we go here. Next, pick a yellow square, any yellow square. I think you can see what's coming. If it were to pick the square again, it will now have no walls to choose from. All right, so pick a yellow square, any yellow square. Let's say it picks this one and then pick a wall, any wall. Whoops, there are no walls. What do we do? What we do now is we make it green. And we say that this square is done. Okay, and then we keep going. Pick a yellow square, any yellow square. So the purpose of making it green is to just say, you know, don't pick that anymore. We're done with that. All right, and then it'll pick another yellow square. Let's say it picks this one. Um, and uh, there's only one wall to choose from, so we'll choose that one. And then this one becomes yellow. And then now the next time that square is chosen, it will have no walls, so that one becomes green. Okay, so when I said pick a wall, any wall, it will only pick walls that go to a red square. So when so if we pick this square now and we pick this wall, that's not allowed because it doesn't lead to a red square. And that's how we prevent there from being loops in the maze. So as long as we always go to a red square and then immediately mark the red square yellow, that will make sure uh, that it will never go back to a square that it's already been at. And this way, there will never be a cycle, right? And this way, the thing that we end up creating is called a spanning tree. A spanning tree is a structure which... Um, ooh, spanning tree protocol. I want a spanning tree. Thank you. Right, so let's say you have this um, these nodes. You can see how these lines connect the nodes in a way that there are no loops anywhere, but all of the nodes are still visited. Okay, this is called a spanning tree. It's called spanning because it spans the entire set of nodes, and it's called a tree because it has no loops, right? Tree is just a sort of technical term in graph theory to say that it has no loops. So we are ensuring that it has no loops because we, we pick every square only once, and we are ensuring that it's spanning because uh, we don't stop until there are no red squares left. Right, so when it says pick a yellow square, any yellow square, it will actually stop doing that when there are no red squares left. Okay, so once we have no red squares left, we're done with the maze.
So this is how the general maze generation algorithm works. I actually created this algorithm for Strike Kaboom some days ago for a new module that he is working on, in which he needed a maze. But you can uh, find pretty much the exact same algorithm in Vanilla Maze and in Morse Maze. Uh, it's a pretty standard algorithm. But for our purposes, going back to the manual, you'll see that there is actually a difference. Because in our uh, manual, not all of the places that you can go are two-way, right? We have some places where you can only go one way. So what do we do? Well, you know, if we run the same algorithm, but then every time, okay, so let's go back to the start. So let's say I pick the uh, top wall here and I go to the top square, make it yellow. If we now say that this is, you know, you, you can only go um, up, but not down like that. Oh, come on. Uh, right? If we say you can only go up, then, um, that's a bit fake. <laughs> Jesus. All right. So if we were to say that this wall can only be traversed up, then it means you can never get back down. Because remember that we never choose a square twice, which means that we will never come back to the square and nothing will ever point into that square. So how do we make sure that we can actually get back to this square? All right, the answer is uh, the following. What we actually do is we run the entire algorithm twice, but we start on the same start square both times. But we generate different spanning trees. And the first spanning tree will have all of the arrows point to the new square that we go to, and thus everything will point away from the starting square. In the second spanning tree, we'll uh, mark all of the directions going the other way, backwards, like this, right? Um, and that will ensure that everything points towards the start square. And this means that there is always a path from any square to any square, because at worst, you can go from any square to the start square uh, through the second spanning tree, and then from the start square to the other square you want to go to through the first spanning tree. There we go. That is how the algorithm works. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you this algorithm in JavaScript code now, because I have three arrows, uh, not arrows, arrays here, to do, processed, and done. These relate to the three colors that I've just used. To do is the red ones that we haven't looked at yet, processed is the yellow ones that we have looked at and we don't want to visit again, and done is the green ones that we're just not going to select from anymore because they don't have any walls to select from. All right, I'm going to explain the structure of the rest of the algorithm while translating this into C Sharp, because we are going to need to translate it into C Sharp, uh, because the um, uh, module obviously needs to use the same structure. All right, so let's get cracking. Uh, let's uh, copy all of this code. Probably don't need this, because that's the SVG. That's not going to be needed in the module. OK, so here we're going to have rule seed. Uh, what was the root of the spanning tree of rule seed 1? Um, huh, well, let's see if you can figure this out. No, it's actually pretty hard to figure out because you can't actually tell which arrow is from which spanning tree. Let me just quickly paste the code here, comment it out. Uh, since you asked this question and since you're apparently interested, I can uh, show you this. You may notice that the um, arrows are here, right? This is the path object that encodes the arrows, and they're always in this same color. I can make this color dependent on the uh, which spanning tree it is from. So right now, when I set the link, I set it to true. Instead, I can set it to the number of the spanning tree, which I've actually called directionality. So let's just do that. Okay, so here I'm going to say if directionality is equal to uh, zero, then use that color, else use some other color. And I'm just going to use some, I don't know, screeching screeching red for this, just to make it visible. Uh, and then they all go red, uh, because um, they all, because directionality, I'm stupid. What I want is um, uh, SQ, oh, right, SQ, right. OK, so we have SQ is a structure which looks like, um, which looks like, uh, which looks like this. All right, so every square has an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and then an array of connections, and also the digit that is inside the square, and then the corner and the color. But this is the important one. All right, so every entry in this array 
tells you uh, whether or not you can connect to the square that goes in that direction. So this is up, this is right, this is down, this is left. So instead of true and false, it's now either false or one of the numbers. So instead of directionality here, I have to say uh, sq.connections in the direction dir. All right, there we go. So now you can see the first spanning tree is the one with the gray arrows. And now it's pretty obvious the, the start square is actually the top left. All of the red arrows point towards it, and all of the gray arrows point away from it. If I go to another um, rule seed, you can now see that the gray starting square is this one. Everything points away from here, right? It goes like from here it goes like down and then left and here is a dead end and then it goes down here all the way here and then up dead end and then here it goes left uh, and then from this square it goes up from this square it goes up from this square it goes up and then left and that's our spanning tree for the uh, first directionality the gray one all right so uh, do we actually want the corner piece to be the start or end uh, maybe we don't. And fortunately, we can easily just manipulate this because at the start of my rule seed code, I have this little for loop just to add a little bit of randomness. I can just simply just tweak this number, change it to like anything else, and everything changes. So let's see where the start square is now. It's now here. I think I want one of the middle squares to be the start square in rule seed one. So I'm just going to keep fiddling until that is the case. Oops, it is still the top left. Um, all right, 30 maybe, and it is still the top left. Uh, 40 maybe, and now it is um, this one, still not in the middle. <laughs> All right, let's try 60, and now it's somewhere down here. It's uh, this one. Oh, this is harder than I expected uh, to do. Bingo, now it's here. All right, so this is what I'm going to stick with. I've just randomly decided this is going to be rule seed one. <laughs> All right, so that, that number 70 is obviously just arbitrary, but as long as it's the same as in the module, um, I can keep it. All right, now let's uh, remove this again. So I don't want this uh, weirdly colored anymore. I want this uh, like that. And now I'm going to change this back to true. Bingo. And. Um, and I don't need this anymore because it's either true or false. So I'll just remove that. Same thing. OK, so now that I've changed this, I'm going to take another copy and paste of this uh, before I, change, before I uh, translate this to C-sharp. So um, let's see. Paste and do this. OK, so we're going to go through the algorithm. So the first thing we do, the first thing we need actually is we need the uh, km rule seedable component here. Rule seedable. Let's put that in. And just so I don't forget, I'm immediately going to do this because I am almost certainly going to forget if I don't do this. Put that in here. There we go. And then apply and save. Now I can set the rule seed down here, but of course I'm going to start with rule seed one. OK, so the first thing we do is just randomly decide on some skipping, which we do with, uh, all right, so we now need our random number generator, which we get from the rule seedable component get RNG function. All right, and uh, I definitely, definitely, definitely want all of my rule seeded modules to output the rule seed. So um, uh, using rule seed. Uh, rnd.seed. All right, that's our seed. Now, we want another number from 0 to 70. Um, uh, all right, I guess we just want next then. Next. Yeah, all right. So that will skip um, some number of numbers at the start. Uh, we want a shuffle up of the digits from the serial number. OK, so what this does is we take the 10 possible digits and shuffle them up. And then we add another 10 uh, digits, shuffle those up. That way, we guaranteed get one of every digits from the first array, and then uh, six uh, distinct numbers from the second array. Right? This way, every last digit of the serial number is represented, and none of them is overrepresented. We have, you know, every number is either once or twice. OK, so serial number digits. Uh, let's go. We shuffle Fisher Yates. Uh, this needs to be an array. 
Uh, there you go. Actually, no, I want this to be a list uh, because this dot push uh, means I, I need to add things. All right, so let's uh, shuffle Fisher gets this. Now this time I can make it an array or a list. It doesn't matter because you know dot add range is just gonna add all of them, so it doesn't matter whether I add them from a list or an array because that gets uh, discarded immediately. And let's do the same thing here. Corner colors. Um, these are 16 numbers, which um, imagine these 16 numbers to be laid out in a 4x4 four four square. All right, so wherever this number occurs, the row is going to be the color and the column is going to be the corner. All right, so that's how I shuffle those up. Okay, um, now we have our three lists. I'm, I'm going to make these lists of, uh, now they contain the actual cell information, which is this kind of object here, All right? So let's actually um, declare a little class for that. I'll put the class above the, so we have a class called uh, cell info and every cell has a public uh, X coordinate, a Y coordinate, um, it has the connection, which is a boolean array, um, and this is always going to be a uh, array of four elements, so I can instantiate that right here, so I don't actually need to write this out. Uh, then we'll have a digit, uh, that's the serial number digit. Um, then we have the corner and the color, public int corner, which is 0 to 4, and public int color, which is 0 to 4. Right. Um, okay, uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to instantiate lists of these cell info things, right? And we need four of those. So let's do this, this, and this. I forgot the news uh, keyword there. Now, you may wonder why I'm adding these initial squares to the done array, because aren't they supposed to start out red? Aren't they supposed to start out in the to-do? Well, actually, yes, I'm actually moving them from done into to-do here, because um, once I'm done with the first directionality, all of the stuff will be in done, and then I have to move it all back to to do in order to do the second directionality. So this is, you know, this this works out nicely. So I just put them in done and immediately move them to to do. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's it's just cleaner that way. So we are going to add a new cell info thing where the x coordinate is this, the y coordinate is this. The connections array doesn't matter because it's initialized automatically. The serial number digit is that. The corner is that. Percent four. So this is modulo four, which gives me basically the column that the number is in, right? So zero, one, two, three. And then after that, these numbers give me zero, one, two, three, and then zero, one, two, three. So that gives me the, co uh, the corner. And then of course the color is uh, divided by four. Uh, and the only reason I needed to do this here is because JavaScript always does uh, floating point division, so I needed this to round down. But in C Sharp, if I use the slash on an integer variable, it will already do integer division, so this is all I need. And the same, of course, applies here. Don't need these parentheses. There we go. Okay, we decide on a start square. We need to decide on the start square outside of the for loop because each of the directionalities, each of the spanning trees, needs to have the same starting position. So here we go, this is our starting position. Um, and now let's uh, uncomment the outside of that for loop. So for each directionality, we want to move everything from done to to do. Now in JavaScript, I was able to do this in this single line. Unfortunately, C sharp does not have an equivalent to the splice. So I'm going to do this in two calls, which is to do add range uh, done and then done clear. And that's, uh, that does the same thing. It just adds it all to to do and then clears the done list. All right, so um, start ix. All right, this is the index of the square that, uh, that has the start position. So this is the actual start square for the spanning tree. So, hmm. In, ah, okay, so uh, apparently my copy of the modkit doesn't have this index of function, so why don't I add it? Um, let's go to uh, 
a km script, that's where it is, general extensions, right? Does this one not have an index of function that takes a lambda? Uh, apparently it does not. Whoop, I just pressed control F1, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, it doesn't. So I'm actually going to, actually let me see if it has something called find. No, it doesn't. Confirm C sharp is inferior, lol. Um, no, not really. I mean, it's actually pretty cool that, that you know, I can write this method and then you can all have it. Uh, up until now, I've always put this method separately in every one of my module because, modules, because we didn't have this general extensions file. Mm. So let's take a public static com. We want it to return an int, and we want to take we want it to take any enumerable thing of any type. So I need to parameterize this by a type. That's the source, and then I need a function that returns a boolean for every such object uh, to decide which one I'm looking for. Right. So um, I'm going to start with zero. Uh, first of all, I'm going to throw an exception if source is equal to null, right, because that, that really shouldn't happen. Um, so we start at zero, and then uh, using... No, I'm just going to go for each uh, element in the source. If uh, the predicate at this element is true, then we return i. Otherwise, we increment i. And if we didn't find it, we return negative one. Right, there we go. That's our index of. Um, so now we can use that. And let's already remove the red squiggle. That's nice. All right. So we want to remove that uh, element from uh, the uh, to do pile. So this is this is marking the first start square yellow. Right. So we're going to in to do. We're going to remove at the index start ix. Um, and to the process, we're going to add uh, that element. Okay, so this way I've moved it to process. Now, what are these? Well, these are just the um, uh, the. Okay, so hang on. So I've got four directions, right? I've got a direction going up, right, down, and left. What this here says is how much by how much do you need to change the x coordinate in your grid to go in each of these directions, and this is how much to change the y coordinate. Now I'm going to move these up because I don't really need those to be inside the loop. It doesn't matter where they are. All right. So now we get to this while loop. When this while loop is finished, the uh, to do list will be empty. Uh, but the processed list will still contain all of the remaining yellow squares. So we are going to uh, put all stuff from processed into done and then clear processed. Okay, and now comes the meat of the algorithm, the one where you pick a yellow square, then pick a wall at random, uh, and then, you know, do what you need to do. So first we pick a random index from the uh, list of processed squares, which is the yellow square. So we're picking a random yellow square. And we also want to know the x and y coordinate for those. Uh, and now we need to determine what the possible connections are. So we have this array available connections. And we're going to um, uh, determine which ones there are. OK, so we have a list of now Apparently, I put here an object that has the destination index, which is the square that the wall points to, and of course, the direction that it goes to. So we're going to need a tiny little class for that. So let's quickly do that. Sealed class uh, direction info, I guess. And this one has a public int uh, direction and a public int uh, uh, destination index. All right. So we want a, did I call it direction info? Yeah, I called it direction info. So for each of the directions from 0 to 4, if uh, going in that direction is uh, uh, still within the bounds, so it's not off the left edge, not off the right edge, not off the top edge, and not off the bottom edge, and the square that we go to is red, right? This is what this, uh, so it checks that to do still contains in fact, in this case, I can just say any, so I don't need this part. OK, so here is where uh, C-sharp is superior to uh, JavaScript, because C-sharp has this dot any. Um, 
Oh, I'm done. I do need the index because I'm actually assigning it right here to dest index, which I need here. So I'm going to uh, go back to using index of. So I'm going to find a square whose x coordinate is in the direction of dir, whose y coordinate is in the direction of dir, and which is in to do, which makes it red. Now, if that is equal to negative one, then it's not in the to do array. So um, we are, you know, now that I think about it, I don't actually need any of this because the squares that are out of bounds are obviously not going to be in that array either. So I can actually reduce this line of code. Let me just very quickly make sure that this theory holds, because if I remove all of this, I want to see, bingo, it still generates the exact same manual. And it doesn't crash. There are no error messages in the console. JS does have any. It's called Sam. I know. I know Sam. Uh, I was uh, kind of kidding. Um, so we have an index. Also, hi, Sam. I didn't realize you were here. Hi, Jerry Aris. Welcome. OK, so we assigned the destination index here. So now we want to add a, uh, a direction info where the direction is dir and the destination index is destix. Now, why is this red underlined? Ah, OK, I need to call it int because it needs to be an int. So now we have a list of up to four direction info objects, which we can simply uh, choose a random from, unless, of course, there aren't any. So if there aren't any, then the count of this will be equal to zero. And if that is the case, then we'll make this square um, uh, uh, green, right? So moving it from process, which is yellow, we put into done, which is green. So we remove at this index. And that's that. Let's see. Um, I was talking about the one line JS that has two lines in C sharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, I get that. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's OK. It's all right. So if we do have a direction to uh, choose from, we are going to invoke our random number generator to choose one of them at random between 0 and count. Uh, now, if our directionality is zero, then we are generating the one where we point away from the starting square. So from the square that we've just looked at, uh, we are going to set the connection in that direction. But if we're in the other directionality, we want to do the reverse. So we want to find the square in, uh, in the to-do array. Uh, which we which we know is uh, correct because this dest index here was um, determined from the to do index from the index in the to do array. So this will give us the square that we're moving to, and we can set the connection in this direction to true. But we need to reverse the direction because we're going in the backwards direction. So if we're looking at the direction up, we actually need to set the down connection for the target square. Right. So what this does is it reverses the direction. All right, then we need to add this square to uh, processed and then remove it at uh, this index. So that moves it from to do, which is red, to process. So this way we make sure that we visit every square only once. And that's it. We basically have it. So at this point now, I could uh, output a uh, uh, log message for the uh, corners module uh, just to see. Uh, let, let's take a look at just the first square, the top left square, which should be bottom left, blue, five, and it should have only one connection to the right. So let's, um, so this will be the connections, I guess. And then this will be the corner, the color, and the number. All right. So. Um, you know, actually, since I don't know where in the array is, I'm I'm also going to output an x and y coordinate and let let myself be surprised by which one is the first one in this list. Okay, so first we need the module ID. I mean, don't really need because I'm probably going to remove this again anyway. So here we wanted the connections array, so I'm going to join these with uh, uh, commas, I guess, um, and each of those are going to be either true or false, right? 
So after that, we wanted, so this is going to be to do zero. Let's do, copy that. All right, so we wanted the color. We wanted the corner. We wanted the uh, serial number digit. And now we do this five, six, which is X and Y. All right. So now if I run this, we should find argument outer range in line um, 125. Why am I looking at to do? I'm, I want done. I want the ones that are completed. I wonder if any of you commented on that. None of you did. There we go. Okay. Let's run this. Okay, so we're getting 3-3, three, three, so that's the bottom right corner. Uh, and we're getting false, 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 true, which means that there's only one way out, which is on the left, that is correct. And then we have 1-1. One, one. Uh, since the colors are red, green, blue, yellow, that's correct for green. And the corners start in the top left, which means that 1 is top right. So that's also correct. And then finally, the 5 is, of course, the digit. So this is absolutely correct and 100% correct. Um, let's just for fun look at another square. Uh, actually, wait, no. The next square will obviously be uh, this one, because that's the only one that this one goes to, right? Um, oh, no, wait, wait, it would... No, it's because of the second directionality that this doesn't hold. So let's let's try that. Let's see what happens if I do done one. Oh, come on. Is that zero above the timer, the last digit? No, that's the um, number of strikes. The last digit on the serial number is on the serial number, which is here. There you go. That would be a seven. All right. Um, so I accidentally clicked one of the squares. So we have 0, 3, which is this square here. Let's see. Uh, false, true, false, false. That means you can only go right. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Then we have 3, which is the last color. So that's yellow. 0 is the first corner, is top left. That is correct. The last digit is an 8. OK, I am convinced that my translation of the algorithm is correct. So let's uh, keep going, which means I don't need that. Uh, log message anymore. But I do need the uh, solution. I, I need to figure out. So first of all, um, I need to color the corners, obviously, right? I'm currently coloring the corners uh, completely at random up here with this loop. But I can't do that, because what if the last digit of the serial number is a 5? I can only do either this or this. So I have to have either a blue bottom left or a green top right. And I can't have both, because then it'd be ambiguous. Similarly, if the last digit is a 0, I have to have blue in the top left. There's just no way around that. OK, so this is what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, delete all of this. Okay, so um, this is the end of the rule seed, so let's mark that. All right, so we do want four colors, so I'm going to keep that array, and we do want to set the colors to the uh, clamps correctly afterwards, right? Um, but here's what I'm going to do. So there are actually 16 different ways uh, that colors, corners, you know. So I'm actually going to start with a list of all the numbers from 0 to 16, which I can turn to a list, which reminds me that I can do the same thing here. Here is another shortcoming of, um, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, JavaScript. Uh, I, I always have to imagine I wanted not 4 by 4, but 10 by 10. I would have to write all 100 numbers, right? Whereas in C sharp, I can literally just say innumerable in innumerable dot range 0, 016, right? And then here, obviously, I want uh, range 0, 10. Um, and here, I want a list containing the numbers 10. So I'm just going to go to list. There you go. Um, all right. I need to turn this into either an array or a list, and I need to turn this into either an array or a list. Uh, in fact, this one was an array, so I'm going to keep it an array. And this one here doesn't matter because I'm calling add range on it, so that gets uh, that doesn't matter. 
And now I'm going to do the same thing here. So I have a list of all of these. Now, um, for the, uh, the last digit of the serial number may, um, mandates, mm, mandates one of them. So um, the serial number last digit obviously is um, bomb, no. serial number numbers last. That gives me an integer with the last digit. And now, um, valid combinations for the serial number last digit, valid to the corner color combinations are, looking at all the um, squares that we've got from our algorithm, we're going to look at a square whose um, serial number digit is equal to that. And we're going to pick one at random. OK, so this is. Um, a, this is a combination of corner and colors that we've already got. Except that, wait, I just picked at random a square. Uh, from that square, I want the uh, combination of color and corner, which is, um, yeah, I'm just going to do this. All right, so um, the color, uh, the color should be times four and then the corner. All right, so so what I'm doing here is I'm turning color and corner back into this uh, four by four arrangement that I talked about here. Let me just complete this just so it looks complete. Right, so if the corner is the row, the, the color is the row, then that's actually the one that I want to add. And the corner is the column. No, that's the wrong way around. This, this is what it is, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, so let's say the color is three. Right, then you actually want to start here, so it's three times four. And then you add the corner, so if it's the zeroth corner, it's here, the first, second, third. All right, so this is what I have. And as I say this, you know, it occurs to me that this doesn't even need to have these two values separate. So actually, I can literally just do this, and that will simplify some of the code. Like here, I can literally just do this. And I don't need to do all this um, divide and modulo. Um, none of this uh, code cares about the corner colors. We only co care about it now. But in the JavaScript, I'm going to keep it because I do care about it because I need to color the corners and the, um, uh, you know, I need to color the corners correctly. Okay, so uh, here we we just have our color corner. So this means I don't need the dot select. I can just access it here after the pick random. So now we have a corner color combination that is defi definitely valid for the serial number's last digit. So we need to um, remove from this list all of the combinations uh, that are in the same corner. Right? So list.remove uh, all, that's the one. See, that takes a predicate. So I want to remove all the combinations uh, whose, um, whose corner, which is, of course, modulo 4, is the same as the one in the combination that we already have. Right, and now I want to do that three more times to get valid combinations for the other three. All right, so um, that means that so these are actually the available combinations. That's why I'm going to call that. And then I'm going to have the combinations that I decided on as a new list of integers. And I'm going to do this whole thing four times. But the first time, I'm going to decide the combination on the basis of the serial number last digit, like that. And otherwise, oops, I, I forgot the uh, open curly. There you go. Otherwise, I'm just going to pick a combination at random from the available combinations. Pick random. There you go. OK. Let me very quickly make sure that this is correct. So the first time I do this, I pick the combination that is valid for the serial number. And in all other cases, I pick one that is still available. And then I remove all of the available combinations uh, that, that, that are in the same corner. So obviously, I want. Uh, this to be in my combinations array, so now I should have four combinations. So 
uh, combination i is going to have a uh, um, corner. The corner is uh, modulo 4, right? And the color is um, divide by 4. Okay. This should work. Famous last word. Famous last words. Okay, where do you remove the serial number combination from available combination? That's here. Right. The reason I did this for loop uh, and then still have an if inside it, because usually, you know, this is kind of bad practice because you can literally just do this before the for loop. But the reason I put it in the for loop is because I want this removal of available combinations to happen in all four iterations. And of course, this as well, this addition into the list. All right, so that's that's what I'm doing here. Now, um, we can actually reduce the size of this code by moving the serial number last digit because, you know, we only need to reduce that once. And that means that this whole thing uh, here can be a, a conditional uh, expression. So if i is equal to 1, then we do this, else we do this, and that's our combination. There you go. Bingo. All right, so in the first iteration, we find one that works with the serial number. In all other cases, we find an available combination uh, at random. OK, let's uh, output all of the combinations that we've decided on. Um, all right, corners 0. Um, corners R, colon. Um, you know, I'm actually just going to output that in here in this. Uh, yeah, I'm going to output that in here in this uh, array because um, this is the corner, right? So I can just say, for example, top left corner is blue or whatever, right? So mod oops, module ID. So the top left, uh, so this would be. So there's either top left or top right or uh, bottom right or bottom left, right? And then the same thing for the colors. The color obviously is divided by four. And then here we have red, green, blue, yellow. There you go. And now if we run this, we should get four, four little log messages to tell us what the corner colors are. All right, the top right corner is blue, and indeed it is. The bottom right corner is yellow, and indeed it is. The bottom left corner is green. Bingo, this seems to have worked, all right? So the log messages match what the corner colors are. All right, uh, bottom left is blue, top right is green, bottom right is red, and top left is blue. Now, we uh, want to make sure that this works with the serial number. The serial number ends in 5, so we have to have either bottom left blue, which is what we do. So that works. So let's start again. Um, now the last digit is a 7, which occurs uh, here and here. So the bottom right corner has to be yellow or red, and indeed it is yellow. And now we have an 8. The 8 occurs only once, so the bottom left must be green. And uh, bottom... Oh, interesting. That did not work. The last digit is an 8. Oh, I see, there is another 8. Oh, I missed that. Okay, so the top left could be yellow, and indeed it is. And this means that the bottom left can't be green. And indeed, uh, it is red. Right, so um, this is something I forgot to do, because if, if it decides to use this square, it can't put green in the bottom left corner, otherwise the, um, uh, otherwise the starting position would be ambiguous. So we actually have to remove this from the available uh, connections uh, combinations as well. So uh, available combos. So the, I guess maybe I shouldn't have done this because oof, 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 oof. Um, yeah. Okay, you know what? I'm going to un undo what I... Um, I don't want to undo that part. I'm going to un undo what I did here. If i is equal to 0, then uh, 
uh, combination is equal to this, uh, else a combination is equal to this. Um, all right, except now, so I guess I can put this back here now. So now I also, from the available combinations, I need to remove all other combinations uh, for which this is true. Um, ah, sorry, right, I need to remove all of the... Yeah, I need to remove all of the values that, that are basically this here. So for each square where the serial number is that, I need to select out the uh, corner color. There you go. I need to remove all of those. Um, so remove range. Ah, remove range actually removes a range from index to count. So I actually need to... Um, right, okay, I'm just going to remove all... Uh, where done dot any uh, that and okay so I'm going to remove all the combinations whose uh, uh, wait 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 um, anything from d right okay uh, I want to remove all the combinations uh, for all the things that have this serial number digit. So, um, yes, so th this should be correct, right? So if, if there is another square that has the same serial number last digit, then I need to remove that. Okay, I think this is correct. Okay. Right. Uh, you know what I just realized? I realized that this code, yeah, so I could actually do the question mark colon thing again, but I don't wanna, it's, you know, it's confusing enough as it is. So I think this, this should work now. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the serial number end in uh, seven now to make, sh sorry, in eight, right? I want to have it end in eight. Uh, and then I'm going to run it a few times to make sure that I will not get the uh, um, get an invalid combination. So let's put this uh, edge word combination here in the test harness, which is right here. So we put that here. And then we're going to change this edge word combination so that the uh, serial number is like uh, some letters, then a digit, letters, and then the last digit needs to be an 8. All right, so now if I run this, hopefully the serial number picked up on that. Yep, there you go, that's the serial number, and of course there are no widgets because I didn't add any. Um, so now I want to make sure that bottom left green and top left yellow never occur together, right? So I can't have uh, green and yellow on these two. So this time it shows yellow here. And another one that's yellow here. And another one that has green there, and this is not yellow. Okay, so this seems to be working. It seems to never choose one where you have green and yellow. So that's cool. All right, so I think this is working. So now we always have a valid, um, a valid a starting square. All right. Why is this so... Uh, there you go, that, that's much better. So the next thing we need to do is we need to calculate the correct solution. The correct solution now only depends on the starting square and the colors of the remaining color, the corners. Here's what we're going to do. We know what the start square is and the remaining three squares, we can find them in the grid. And then we go through all possible uh, orders that we can um, visit those three in, uh, of which there are six, right? There are six different ways of ordering three things because it's three factorial. And then we're going to calculate the shortest path for all of these uh, permutations and then make sure that the shortest path uh, 
yeah, and then see what the shortest path is. Now, there are some combinations where there might be a tie, and I haven't quite yet decided whether I want to just allow ties or um, just generate the module in such a way that there is never a tie. If you have an opinion on that and you want to chip in, then please go ahead and mention that now in the chat, and uh, we'll see if, uh, if enough people vote, then I guess I'll go with the majority. All right, let's see. I'm going to write down what I literally just said uh, in a comment, all right? Uh, test all... Okay, so we, we now know which square, uh, which square is the uh, first, which, uh, yeah, which corner is the first to click, and which square this corresponds to in the diagram. Uh, test all permutations of the remaining three um, and calculate uh, their path lengths. Okay, we have one vote for I don't mind either way. All right. Test all permutations of the remaining three and calculate their path lengths. Okay, so for each var um, order, I'll call it order, in. All right, so the first order is, um, oh yeah, I, I first need to know what this, uh, the remaining squares are. So the remaining uh, squares are um, to do, no, it's done, where uh, the combination, the corner color combination, uh, is in combinations where combinations dot contains. Okay, so that gives me that gives me all four of them. So I'm just gonna make that into a list. Um, okay, so this gives me all four of them, but I want to remove the one that uh, pertains to the starting combination, which is always combination zero. So I can actually just skip one here, and it will always give me the remaining three combinations. Okay. Um, I also need to make sure that the starting, that I know what the starting square is, as opposed to just the starting combination. So um, let's have a variable here. And that's an int. Well, actually, I'm going to have to assign something to it. So once we've decided on this combination, um, right, so um, we actually want the uh, start square to be picked at random. And then I want the combination to be that start square's corner color combination. And I want the starting square uh, to be equal to um, ah, yeah, starting square index, obviously. Um, I'll just call it starting SQ. Right, I want the starting square's coordinates, which is x and y. So, um, I am going to... How do I do this? Okay, so if, if I could either have the x and the y coordinates or I could have the actual starting square. You know, maybe I, that's, that's what I'll do. You know what, I'll do that. So I want the um, square info, is that what I called it? No, I called it, um, what did I call it? It was not connection info, cell info. Right, cell info, okay. So, um, so maybe I should call it square info because that's, you know, I've been referring to them as squares the whole time, so that's what I was looking for. Okay, so the starting square uh, is uh, this one here. There we go. Starting square. All right. Okay, so now we know the starting square. Square. And now we need to calculate all of the uh, path lengths. Okay, so for each order in, okay, so the, the first order is um, remaining squares uh, 1, 2, 3, right? And then we have one that is 1, 3, 2. And then we'll have 2, 1, 3, 
and two, three, one. And then we have three, one, two, and finally three, two, one. Okay, these are all of the um, possible orders that we can put these in. Right? So we want, we actually want an array of these. There you go. So for each of these permutations, uh, permutation, let's do that. So the total length is equal to the um, path length from um, the uh, starting square to uh, permutation zero plus the path from permutation zero to permutation one plus one to two and that's it yep that should be it now i just noticed that i did remaining squares one two three and so zero one two uh yeah that should have been zero one two um so ones become zeros twos become ones and threes become twos right, that's more like it all right so now we need to write the uh path length method or we'll do that later so var uh, shortest length so first of all, we, we'll set this to int dot max value because it's never going to be that length. Um, so if that total length is less than the shortest length we found so far, um, and let's also uh, have a boolean for whether there is a tie. So if we found a smaller one, then not only is the shortest length now equal to this, but we also uh, no longer have a tie in case we found one earlier. And we also need the shortest path, which is the order in which to press uh, the uh, corners, which is, of course, the solution. All right, so the solution is going to be a list of uh, integers of 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, which is the four corners. So, um, right. Hmm. I am going to, because each of these, ah, I see, I see, okay, yeah, so, okay, so the solution is going to be, let's see, so the, the first uh, corner that you need to press is the uh, starting square, and then you have the remaining squares, so basically permutation has the squares that we need to press, the squares in the manual, and we need to convert those to the corners. And that's easy because each of them has a uh, corner colors thing, which we can just, you know, we can use this to uh, modulo four to get the corner. So we're going to go permutation, so for each of the um, squares, uh, we take the corner color combination percent four that's the corner and that should give us the solution right and it's going to be an integer array okay uh, else if uh, the total length is equal to the shortest length then we have a tie until we find a shorter one which might still happen Okay, and now we can just say if there is a tie, then we're just going to try again and just, you know, generate another puzzle, uh, which we do here. Okay, do we even need that array clamp colors anymore? No, because we derive the colors from available combinations. Right? It's down here in this... Uh, here in this for loop, we set the material colors to this. Okay, so this means that we don't want to do this if we have to do it again. So we're going to do that after the, you know, d determining whether there is a tie. Okay, so now that all that's left to do now is to find the shortest path length uh, between two squares. In order to do this, that function needs uh, access to the uh, set of squares, obviously. So we're going to have to put that in. All right, let's generate this method. And it has a list of square infos, which is, I'm just going to call that squares. And the square info, this is the, uh, the square that we go, to, uh, go from. So this is the source and this is the target. Or destination, let's call it destination. Um, so we are going to use, um, what's it called? 
um, breadth first search. We're going to start with the source square, uh, put it into a queue. So we need a queue, a queue of square infos. There you go. And we start with the source square. There we go. And then while uh, there is still stuff left in the queue, we're going to dequeue an item and then check if that one can take us to the destination. Right? For that, we are going to need these uh, dx and dy ar ar uh, arrays. So I'm just going to copy those into here. Um, ah, okay, it doesn't let me do that, so just do that, I guess. Okay. Each of these Q elements needs to have the square info as well as the distance uh, that we've found for it so far. Uh, hello there, Kilmunday, uh, Samuel. Well, welcome to the stream. So I'm going to... Um, okay, so th this Q thing should really have a tuple of square info and distance, but, you know, uh, it's easier to actually just add this here, public int... Uh, uh, distance uh, used during the breadth first search algorithm uh, to find uh, the path lengths. So outside of that algorithm this value is just going to be meaningless but we can just use it because every square is associated with one distance and we always assign to it before we read from it again so there we go. Um, we do actually need to set the source distance to zero, though. Okay, so we unqueue an item. So we look at the the first one here, obviously, will be the source square, the one that we're going from. Okay, and there are four different directions that we could potentially go in uh, if that item's connections in that direction, in that direction, is true. Right? If it is not, then you can't go in that direction. Um, we also need to make sure that we don't uh, revisit a square that we've already visited. So we actually also need a hash set of uh, square infos that we've already visited. Okay, so um, if uh, visited add item. So this will return true if it added to the item, which means it wasn't in there, but it will return false if the item is already in there, in which case we have to just continue with the while loop because we've already visited that square. We don't care about it anymore. Okay, so uh, if uh, you can go in that direction, then um, we want to enqueue uh, the square um, whose um, x-coordinate is equal to the x-coordinate we're at, which is item x plus the uh, x-difference, right? And then the same for y, item not y plus dy direction. Okay, so this will give us the square that we're moving to. Okay, so um, var moving to equals that, and then we need to set its distance to the uh, distance of the current item plus one because we've just made a step of one. And then we put that back in the queue. Okay. Um, and now, if the item that we dequeue is actually the destination, then uh, we, we know the distance. And that's it. Okay, so eventually it has to reach the destination square because, you know, it's a spanning tree. I mean, we, it's two spanning trees, but we've made sure that you can always get from any square to any other square. So eventually it will get to the destination square and then just return its distance. So we don't actually need this uh, q.count greater zero, but I, I guess I'll just keep it. Um, so I, I guess I'll put a minus one here so that I'll... Um, no, actually I'll throw an exception. Because this should never happen, right? This is an invalid operation. Um, the breadth first search search algorithm did not encounter uh, the destination square. Trying to go from okay, let's use a string of format for this. We're trying to go from uh, the source square, right? So we want to go from. Uh, 
from source.x uh, source.y. I'm actually not going to use slashes here. I'm going to use a slightly more standard notation, which is uh, better. Uh, and then we want to go from uh, source to destination, so destination y. Um, and the rule seed should be in the log file. So if anyone sends this uh, log file, you know what? I'm actually also going to uh, output that as a log message. So uh, let's do this. So we can just have that and then that and this is corners. Now we've already used one, so I'm just going to make that number four, module ID. And now it's both in the log and in the exception message, so it'll also appear in Unity. All right. So we now have a function that gives us a path length. And um, so here we are going to say um, the solution. Solution is. OK, so we want this. I'm just, I'm just going to call this corner names, all right? So var corner names, so we can always refer to that. Um, the solution, let's see, ah, yeah, it already has that, so um, we're just going to go, the uh, solution is this. So for each integer in the solution array, uh, that is a corner, right? So we're just going to go corner names of that corner. Um, I think C should be enough, and then just put commas in between, there you go. And now let's run. And we get a format exception, which means that I messed up the uh, curly brackets with the numbers. So we're looking at um, log format, uh, logger log format, debug log format. There we go, corners module 175. This is where this happened. Um, yep, that's literally the last line that I wrote that failed. And here we go. Okay, it lists only three. That's because, um, right, see, this only contains the permutation, which is only the remaining square. So I actually need to put the corner of uh, the uh, starting square as well. And this one is a sec selection of squares, and this one is a single square. So I'm just going to prepend, which doesn't exist. Uh, so I'm going to take the starting square and concatenate the rest of the permutation onto it. There you go. So that should give me the entire solution. OK, now the last digit of the serial number is still an 8. And we have a green in the bottom left corner. So we start here. Uh, then we have green in the top left, which is here. Then we have red in the top right, which is here. And we have blue in the bottom right. OK, so this is the starting square. I think it's pretty clear that the quickest way to any square, I mean, we have to go here, there's no other way. And then we have to go here, there's no other way. And then we have to go here, there's no other way except going back. So it's definitely those two first. And then it's pretty clear the fastest way is just to go up to this one and then left to that. So we want bottom left, top right, bottom right, top left. And it says bottom left, top right, bottom right, and top left. That is correct. Let's see if we can, um, yeah, let's actually remove that Edgeware combination, uh, Edgeware configuration, so we can have any serial number again. So let's uh, remove this. Let's change it back to none and save um, and delete this file. OK, so now if I run this, it should have literally any Edgeware. So for example, number four. The last digit is a 4, which means that it's either yellow or red. Turns out it's yellow. So this is the first one. Then we have blue in the bottom right. Then we have, I'm going to mark the blue one red. Actually, I'm going to mark it green because, no, I'm going to mark it red because that's, no, it's green where you start and red where you stop. That's, that's what it is. OK, so then we have red in the bottom left, which is here. And then we have green in the top left, right, which is, Seriously, Firefox just crashed? Oh, wow. that is a rare sight, like very rare. All right, we're going to have to do that again. OK, um, we have green, uh, we have blue, we have yellow, and we have 
red in the bottom left, that was this one. So these are the four. Um, okay. Um, uh, and one, how is var different from int or long or string? Oh, great, Firefox can crash. Uh, it, it's, it, this has never happened to me for like the last, like at least like seven years or so. It, it used to be the case that Firefox could crash uh, a lot, but I thought they fixed it pretty well. So how is var different? Well, the answer is actually it's not different at all, except that it's automatic. So in this case here, I'm putting an, an array of strings here. So var automatically resolves to string array because that is the type of what I put here, right? So I can actually tell Visual Studio here to use the explicit type and it'll just change it back and forth. But it, the function is exactly the same. So here, obviously, the explicit type would be int because that's an integer. And uh, here, uh, because this is an array of uh, you know square types, if I were to put var here and then change it, it oh, OK, that's integers, yeah, because solution, duh. Um, the, uh, Right, the permutation here. This is a square info array. So if I say use explicit type here, that's square info array. All right. So that's what var does. It just automatically knows what the type needs to be and uses that type. That way you don't have to type out longer things like list of list of things. So yes, it's convenience. Well done. And there is actually something, there is a case in which var is necessary, and that involves uh, uh, anonymous types, but we're not going to go into that because that's outside the scope of this uh, stream. So let's not do that now. OK, so I want to see a uh, more complicated case. Uh, all right, let's uh, close this. Uh, I want to see a more complicated um, you know, a puzzle for this. All right, so let, let's see. Um, we now have blue, blue, and yellow, yellow in reading order. So blue, blue, and yellow, yellow. The last digit of the serial number is a seven. So we start here. This promises to be slightly more interesting. Uh, right, the only way to reach this square is from here, which means that we definitely have to go here first and then here. So we can never get to this one first. Um, and if we go to this one first, so if we go left and then down, then we have to take quite a route down here and up here to get back to the zero. By contrast, if I go to the six first, I can literally just go down to the three. So here we have an interesting case. I believe the answer is bottom right, top left, top right, bottom left. Let's see if that's what it says here. Click. And it says bottom right, top left, top right, bottom left. I think the module is working. So now all we need is to be able to press the corners and have the module either strike when it's wrong or um, uh, solve when it's correct. Uh, here is another poll for you guys. Would you prefer if the module uh, resets in the sense of, you know, creates new colors when uh, you get a strike, as in should the colors of the corners change when you strike? Um, or not. That's that's my poll for you. Let me know what you what you prefer. And in the meantime, we're going to uh, do this. So we we now have our solution, but we need the solution to be in a private field. So we need the uh, solution like that. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna uh, remove the line that in uh, where is it. Here, in solution null, let's remove that. And then I can rename this. Um, and then I want to know how far into uh, clicking the right amount. So let's do that. All right. Click, click. Um, but firstly, when should you strike? Right on a wrong button press or when you press all four corners? Um, I'm always against hard resets in modules without a very good reason, and I don't see a good enough reason. Um, well, OK, well, I can see a reason, namely the ability to just brute force it, right? If, if there are only, I mean, there are only 24 ways of uh, ordering the four corners. And if you know the starting square, then there are only six uh, combinations for the rest, 
right? And in particular, if the first two were correct and then it strikes on the third one, then you immediately know the solution. Uh, do you consider that a good enough reason, X Master? If not, I'm happy to hear your input. Uh, Kill Monday has a point though, you know, we, we could avoid the reset but have it only strike after you've pressed all four so you don't actually know which one is wrong. Uh, the, yeah, Kevin Cool says the same thing. That's uh, that's certainly a legitimate method. Uh, but at the same time, I do want to point out that in the graffiti numbers module, graffiti numbers does basically the same thing. It only strikes after you've inputted the um, expected number of uh, numbers and I, I've, I found that a lot of people are very confused by that. A lot of people um, assume that the number where you got the strike is the one that was wrong. Um, I don't know, this is an easy enough module that if you're tanking strikes to brute force it, you're containing wrong. Uh, yeah, okay, that's, that's a totally valid point too. Because um, after all, the same could be said about vanilla wires. You know, if you have only three wires on it, then you can brute force it easily. So yes, in the spirit of Katane, I guess I'm gonna go with established practice and tradition and say that the solution will not change. I will just reset the progress back to zero, so you have to enter the solution a second time. Why don't we? Why don't we put four? status lights on the module, one for every corner. And if you press the correct corner, that status light goes green, but the module doesn't count the soft until all four are green. So you strike always on the last input. Yeah. Oh. Right. OK. So that would mean that, hmm, four state. I'm, I'm, I'm going to. I'm gonna consider that, right? But um, so it just occurred to me that actually I can't turn them green to show that it's correct if I want to strike at the last one. So I'm gonna have to turn them like yellow, and then they all turn green when it's uh, um, when it's all correct. Do I, do I want to bother with the glow thing? I, I think so. I think I do, because it, it looks kind of cool. Um, except I still don't know where that glow thing is in the hierarchy. So you know what? I'm just going to create my own glow thing. I'm going to add an object here. Um, now here's the thing. I know that in the Katane mod kit, uh, there is some kind of glow texture. Light glow. There you go. Uh, let me quickly take a look at what this looks like. Yep, that's that looks like a sort of you know light glow. All right. So let's x copy that file to uh, contain uh, corners assets assets uh, miscellaneous. And now I'm starting to think that we already have three textures. So this is the point at which I'm going to. Uh, what did I just press? Uh, create a folder, there it is, with textures and put the light glow, which I'm just going to call that, the state and actually all of these are textures except what the preview image is not really used as a texture. So let's put that here and then I realized that this year, you know, the um, Unity keeps creating this extra materials folder whenever the opt file changes. So that's not being used, so I can safely delete that. Um, and oh yeah, no, I wanted to, no, I shouldn't have compiled this, I wanted to create this uh, status light here. Let's call this light glow. And let's give it a mesh filter with a uh, quad. Uh, let's also apply. Uh, let's give it a mesh renderer. 
with a uh, material. All right, I need to create a material for this. Uh, let's close this. Materials create uh, create a material. There we go. Um, material light glow. Okay, so this gets the material light glow. There we go. And this should have KT um, uh, transparent, this one. And then give it the texture, which is this one. And I think this is currently rotated by 90 degrees, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's also really huge, obviously. So I'm, I'm also going to reduce it in size, like uh, 0.1, okay, and 90 degrees here. Okay, now it's Z fighting, for obvious reasons. There you go, now it's not Z fighting anymore. Okay, so now we can change the texture to be uh, yellow. So let's go here, open the uh, uh, light glow PNG. And uh, let's see if we can adjust something here. Um, curves. Right, so if I want to change the... Uh, I want to keep red and green and move only the blue. All right, there you go. Now it's yellow. All right, maybe not quite sort of total yellow. Um, sort of yellowish kind of glow, if you see. Oops, didn't mean... I want to move that. Oh, God damn it. I just want to. Okay, that looks more like it. There we go. All right, this is looking like very much the same. But anyway, so there you go. This is yellowish. Let's save that um, as a PNG. Thank you. So now it's yellowish. And let's have it be off by default. Okay. So now. Um, we decided that you strike only after four presses, which means that I need to uh, remember what was entered. All right. So uh, entered of uh, where the progress is is equal to i. If uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, progress progress plus plus. Now if progress is equal to four then uh, we need to check if the answer is correct. If entered is in fact equal to the solution, then, um, and then we uh, handle pass. Uh, so the module is solved. Uh, we output a log message, module solved. There we go. Okay, uh, else you've made a mistake. So we want to give a strike. And then um, you entered this strike. Okay, so uh, remember we had these corner names, corner names here. I'm going to make that a uh, private static string array and then give it an underscore because it's a private field now. And then I can use it here. You entered, uh, what you entered is entered, select. Uh, so for each corner, we want the corner names, uh, C, and then join that with commas. There you go. So this is what you entered. Um, and then I guess we also need to remember that we've solved the module. So we have a module solved Boolean. There you go. Um, and then when you handle pass, we set that to true. And then when you interact with the corner again, uh, which is of course here. So first of all, we actually want to play the um, uh, button press sound, I guess. Button press. And we also want the uh, um, interaction punch, right? We want to play that sound at the corner Corner, corners, these are the game selectables, yes. Corners I transform and then corners I co corners. I dot uh, add interaction punch. Um, there you go. And then if the module has already been solved and that's all we wanted to do. I just realized that when you give a strike, I need to set the progress back, back to zero. Um, right, let's also do the following. Uh, 
Um, so first of all, this here is what happens when you strike. All right. So I'm going to do the following. If progress is equal to four and uh, you uh, didn't enter the correct solution, or or uh, entered contains uh, the button I've already pressed, then we do all the strike thing. Else, uh, if uh, now at this point, if progress is equal to four. Um, At this point, if progress is equal to 4, then uh, the entered sequence must be correct, because if it wasn't, then we would have already striked here. All right, so we can do this. OK, in all other cases, we do this. I checked whether the number 0 is in an array that uh, is full of zeros, obviously. Uh, stream still good, thank you. So instead of entered contains i, I need to make sure that I check only the ones that uh, have been entered. There you go. So if that contains an i, then I should strike. Uh, obviously, I need to add to progress only, uh, basically after this. All right. So I, I could go progress minus one here, but actually, I'm going to increment progress only when it's actually correct, which is here. There you go. Uh, which means that this should be a three. Uh, that, 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 that feels bad because the number four is iconic because it's four presses, right? So actually, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going to do this. This is, this is less, uh, less confusing. Mm. OK. Um, okay, so this tells me whether I've already pressed it. All right, and I wanted this to be square brackets. Um, now, if that is the case, or there is a duplicate. All right, uh, if progress is equal to oops, progress is equal to four, then we do this. Else. Uh, you pressed a duplic. God damn it! Progress is still going to be equal to four if the fourth thing you pressed is a duplicate. So I actually have to do this. Uh, duplicate is duplicate. There you go. All right. You pressed a. Right. You pressed this corner uh, a second time. Strike. Um. After all right, let's let's also output what, what I've pressed before. Uh, right. Okay, so the first thing is the uh, corner name of the corner we're in, which is I, and the rest is. Oh my gosh! I am so wrong. Skip. This should say take. Right. I want to take that many. That was that was the reason we got the strike. So that explains that. I'm I'm only um, improving the logging right now. So let's see. We take that many and then change them and then the comma, right? Okay. Uh, here we have take progress, but progress has now been incremented, so minus one. Let's. Um, so there are a few things. Oh yeah, let's do the SVG next. The SVG will have uh, four status slides, obviously. So let's. Uh, Open, uh, what's it called? Corners. Duh. Um, so I'm going to take this. I'm going to take uh, a copy of it and uh, align these uh, vertically. Apparently, I already accidentally aligned them vertically. Yeah, I did. Right, then take a copy of these and uh, align. Yeah, they're already aligned. Make that a group, make that a group, and align these horizontally. All right, so now they are perfectly aligned. Make it a whole group and align that whole group relative to the page. And now they're in the center. Perfect. That is all I needed. Save that. Uh, uh, open this website. Open the uh, SVG. Paste all of that in this into this website. Copy that and bang! It's super tiny. Yay! Super tiny. Um, hmm. It, it has a G in it, a G tag, which it doesn't need. 
So you know what, I'm going to move this stuff to here and remove it from here. And then we don't need the G tag. And what's the other G tag? Uh, that's, that's a useless G tag. So we have no G tags at all. Um, and let's go back to the manual. And there we go. This is what it looks like now. So that's that done. So now we can go to Chrome and generate the PDF for rule seed one. Uh, save this as corners.pdf. Thank you. All right, so that's that done. Uh, which means that now on the uh, repo thing here, we now have the HTML, the SVG, and where is the PDF? Huh. I must I must have uh, put it in the wrong folder. Uh, let's see where I put it. No, I did put it here. Oh, it's genuinely not there. I have no idea what just happened, but it's here now, so should be fine now. I'm going to have just one status light and it's going to be in the middle. And the four places where we currently have the status lights, I'm going to put LEDs there, uh, like the LEDs on Light Cycle, for example. So um, that's what I'm going to do because all of these problems are not worth it. And, uh, and I don't think it looks all, all that great anyway with the four status lights. I'm sorry. So uh, that means. We're going to get rid of this light glow thing. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm still tempted, though, to just take a copy of all of this. So I'm just going to stage this for now. So if, you know, if, if we end up deciding to go back, I can always go back. All right. So let's remove the light glow thing. Uh, apply. Uh, let's delete literally all of this. Yes, this is literally all we need. Um, uh, don't need that anymore. And we delete all of this and this and uh, I think that's it. Okay, and this. We definitely don't need this. We don't need any of this. Okay. So. All right, so obviously now we have tons of uh, compiler errors. So here we want to set the LEDs to red. So let's let's actually um, uh, define ourselves some uh, variables here. Uh, we want the actual LEDs, and then we want the uh, materials for the LEDs when when they are on. It just occurred to me that we could still actually we could actually still use the light glow textures. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a good idea. We we can still use the light glow textures for the um, LEDs. So let's just restore these and and that. Um, yeah, I, actually, I think I'm gonna restore all of the meta files as well. Um, Okay, so we have the LEDs, and then we want uh, a texture for uh, the LED glow, uh, red, green, and uh, yellow. Um, you know, now that I think about it, we already had that. I didn't need to delete it and now recreate it, but it's fine. It's just setting a few textures. Um, so if the LED is off, then there will be no glow, right? And then we need the uh, then we need materials for a red LED, a green LED, and a yellow LED, and an off LED. There you go. Okay, so this is what we need. And now the first thing I'm going to do, well, actually, I'm I'm going to add these textures here. So status light yellow. Wait, status light yellow. Oh. I still have compiler errors, that's why. Right, so the first thing I want to do is, um, uh, I wanted to do is to design the LEDs, but actually, no, I'm, I'm going to take care of these first. Okay, so we want to set all of the LEDs. Uh, so the LEDs, these are the mesh renderers, perfect. We want to set these materials to, um, and this time I'm going to use shared material because I'm going to have different materials for every. Uh, uh, there you go. And then we're going to need the mesh renders for the LED glows, right? So the LED glow. 
close j uh, dot uh, shant material equals green glow. There you go. Okay, so we don't need this. We don't need this. We do need the glow to show. So we do this. Whoops. And the clamp material color. Oh, this is when you're solved. When so yeah. So that that stays that. So why is this not a material? It's because we made it a texture. So we do uh, dot material dot texture main texture. There you go. Okay. So that's when you make them green. Now let's make them yellow. All right. So not that. Uh, glow yellow and uh, LED yellow. And now let's make them red, which is here. Right. So red LED red. Okay, so this is when you get a strike, this is when you solve it, this is when it goes yellow, but then when it goes back to normal, uh, we want to... Okay, so the material needs to be, uh, when you press it, it's yellow, uh, else uh, off, and the glow yeah, we can just set that to yellow, I guess, and then set it active if pressed. Okay, that's all of our source code, uh, all of our compiler errors fixed. Are there still errors? Oh, yes. J doesn't exist because it's called I. Let's rename that to I. There you go. All right. Uh, still errors. Okay, status light parent does not exist. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's right. This um, this entire setup thing we do not need anymore. We can get rid of all of that and that. Okay, how about now? Build succeeded. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now we set all of these textures. Here we go. Um. So the LED glows. The, these are the game objects that we haven't designed yet. Let's let's put the textures in. So the light glow, uh, yellow, light glow green, light glow red. And I'm gonna call it. Whoops! I wanted to call it the same thing as this. I'm gonna call it LED glow red. So LED glow red, uh, LED glow green, LED glow yellow. And, and now let's do the LEDs. Okay, so here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna create four little objects. Uh, create empty LED um, top left, I guess. Add a component, mesh filter. This is going to be a sphere object and then add a mesh renderer uh, to which we give a new material. Uh, material, which we're gonna call LED red, I guess, which is going to be um, diffuse tint, and it's going to be red. Uh, actually, yeah, no, it doesn't need a texture. It needs to be actual red like this. And I think I want the unlit uh, shader for this because it's supposed to look uh, lit. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Uh, right, let's press apply here and apply the material here. And now we're going to need to make it much, much smaller because it's currently massive. Uh, it's still massive relative to the module. So here we go. Now we have a reasonable size uh, LED. And now I'm going to actually raise the LED a little from the module. So it looks a little bit like it's uh, floating. But then I'm going to add a little sort of cylinder object. Uh, I actually want it further up than that. That's a bit far. Uh, like this, uh, let's, let's put it like this, right? And then I'm going to add a little cylinder object. Um, create this with a mesh filter, which is a cylinder, and then a mesh renderer. Uh, and this is going to be a material matte uh, LED stand or whatever you call it. I don't know. Uh, LED stand, top left. Uh, give that to here and make it uh, this diffuse tint and make it kind of brownish sort of 
So like that. Or or actually literally just make it the same color as the module, which is this. You know, so, so it's actually sort of gray. Hey. Oh. I I need to remove the hashtag sign from the front. That's that's what happened there. Okay, that is a bit dark, so let's make that brighter. Oh, the brightest possible is still uh yeah, okay, there you go. Okay. So we want that cylinder to be much, much smaller, obviously. Uh so we're gonna reduce it in size by point one. Uh um yeah, we need it bigger in the y coordinate, obviously. Okay, that seems to that seems to work. Yeah, it's definitely long enough there. Okay, so let's just make this a nice round number. Okay, and now we have an LED with a stand. Okay, and then the glow obviously will be on the bottom of the. Uh, you know, actually, I don't need to call these. I can call them the same thing. Right, apply that, LED glow, mesh filter, that will be a quad, and then mesh renderer, and the uh, light glow material, which we already have. Uh, there you go. Uh, let's apply that and see why it's not showing. Uh, okay, so this is the yellow glow. You know, I'm going to... No, that's fine, that's fine. All right, so the reason this is happening is because... Ah, there we go, I need to rotate this. 90 degrees and also make it significantly bigger apparently uh, let's make it like five i guess All right that looks good except of course it should be red but but that's uh that's fine um yeah i think that is good so let's leave it at that. Let's design the other colors. So we have a red LED and we're going to need a, uh, a green LED and a yellow LED. Okay, um, so let's try the yellow one. We want that to be yellow, unsurprisingly. Um, Do we want it perfect yellow or do we want it like slightly off? Yeah, I think I like it when it's like this. And this looks like a yellow LED. Um, maybe also make it slightly reddish. So it's like very slightly orange. Yeah, that's that, that looks good. Let's do that. Um, apply that. I didn't need to apply that. Um, so I've already done the red, but I'm gonna take another look at it and see if it looks better if it's... No, I think this one looks best if it's really pure red. And then the green, because this is the solved state, um, it's probably a little uh, darker. So something like this. I'm happy with this color. Okay. But, oh yeah, and then we also want a uh, off material, don't we? Like when the LED is off. Let's give the LED that material. And this one is going to be a diffuse tint. And the color is going to be some uh, brown. Something like this. Okay. Hmm, not sure if it should be brown or at least this brown. I think that's a bit too saturated. Uh, yeah, that looks more like it. Okay, let's leave it at that. Okay, and now let's uh, reset our view of the module. And let's take four copies of this. So first of all, this one is going to go uh, here, except more like here. And this one is here, so this is the top left. Uh, let's take a copy of that and move that other one to the right by changing this. And then we take another set of copies and just change this to negative, change this to bottom left and this to bottom right. 
and then change the order because I want them clockwise. Thank you. Apply, save. Um, right, and then obviously we want the glows to be invisible initially because the LEDs aren't on, and now the brown is too visible, is too clear. So I'm still going to change that. I need that to be much, much darker. Uh, can I see the game tab, please? Yeah, that looks more like an LED. Maybe a bit grayer again. Oh, great, great. Yeah, this is great. This is, this is like an off LED. Apply, save. Okay, so we've got our four LEDs. Now we need to apply the um, objects to this here. So the um, actual LEDs are this, top, left, right, bottom right, bottom left. Um, and then the glows are, of course, these. One, two, three, four. Click. All right. Apply and save. Um, okay, so we've already written all of the code, so I'm just going to run this and see if it works. Okay, we now have a status light in the middle, and we have uh, these... Uh, they, they now look like toothpicks, so the stands clearly need to be um, thicker. Uh, and, and also, I think they're too far up, so I'm, I'm actually going to move the LEDs themselves down a little. Uh, like this. Let me see that from the side. Yep. Oh, that's too far in. Let's try that. that that's good. Maybe this? No, too much. Okay, and then uh, we look at the stands and change the uh, width. No, I think three is good. Right, does that look more like Okay, can't see it from here. <laughs> right, let's do this. Okay, that looks better. Yep, that looks better. Apply that, run. Okay, and now if I click here, it goes magenta because because the um, materials, uh, these materials here. So we need the LED yellow, we need the LED Oops, don't need that. LED red, LED off, and LED green. Apply, save, run. And now it works. Boink, 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 boink. That's wrong. Um, and the correct answer is uh, here. Uh, bottom left, top left, uh, bottom right, top right, cling. There you go. Right? I think the green is a bit too dark. I'm going to make the green a little uh, brighter. But only a little, not too much. Let's try that again. The solution is now top right, bottom left, uh, bottom right, top left. Click. Let's take a look at this. That looks much better. All right, I'm going to keep this. Oh, the glow is not showing. Oh yeah, the glows are not showing. I need to figure out why the glows are not showing. Uh, we have an LED glow here, and it is on, um, but it's not showing. Why wouldn't it be showing? Uh, this is correct. The texture is there. The quad is there. Um, right, where in the scene is this object? Huh. Oh, I see. Okay, so the status light is there. Oh, I see. Oh, because I moved it, the whole thing down, I need to move the glow back up because it's now inside of the module, that's why. Okay, so let's um, show all of these glows. Click. And move them up a little. And let's just make it slightly more just to prevent uh, Z fighting again. Save. And now let's make them invisible again. Boink. Uh, apply, save, run. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so the solution now is bottom right, top right, oops. Uh, bottom right, top right, bottom left, top left. Uh, that, that was not top left, so I, what did I do? Um, what is the correct answer, rather? Bottom right, top right. Yeah, that, that's correct. There we go. Okay. 
I think this this looks good. We now have glow on all of them. Yep, we do. All right, so far so good. Um, so the next thing I want to do is create these uh, um, preview images, the, the sh screenshots is what I mean. So let's run this inside the inside of the game. Why does the center of the status line look darker? Um, it only does that in the test hard. This is probably an effect uh, uh, resulting from the halo. Uh, whereas here you can see that there is an actual sort of proper texture on it. All right, so click, 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 click. That's wrong. All right, um, let's see. Okay, let's find one that is uh, blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue, red, red. That would be this one. All right, let's solve that. That would give us uh, top left, top right, bottom right, bottom right. Click, 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 click. There we go. So that's a solved module. And then we have an unsolved module with um, preferably with uh, all four colors represented. Oh, wow, we don't have a single module with all four colors. OK, doesn't matter, actually. That's fine. Let's just take a screenshot of this. And uh, this, I guess. Oh, wait, that's the same module, so I, I want different colors. Uh, these. There you go. And copy that. OK, I think these are the, uh, yeah. These are the screenshots that I want. OK. Now the colors of the, um, uh, the, the colors of the clamps are not currently in a public field, so Souvenir will have difficulty accessing that. So I'm just going to uh, add that here as well, clamp colors. Right, and then uh, I called it corner colors here. Oh no, that's the, never mind, that's the combinations. The actual clamp colors. Oh, I should probably um, instantiate this here and then just assign them when I assign the materials, which I do here. So uh, clamp colors, um, clamp colors of that is equal to that. Uh, this is for souvenir. This is for souvenir, and this can be read-only. Um, and that's, that's it, right? Okay, so we've got our previews. Now I want to make these previews square, like exactly square. So you know what? I'm actually just going to use this and make it uh, 676 by 676. Make it middle. There you go. That's good. Save that in uh, uh, assets, misc, uh, preview image. Wait, this is the solved one, right? So I'm going to call it solved. Thank you. And then this one, this is going to be the main preview image. Let's change the size of that to 692. OK, done. Save that as the actual preview image. Thank you. And then this one here, uh, preview, preview image 2, I guess. Uh, and resize that to 804, 804, boink. Right, done. Um, now we can click stage all, and something went wrong. What went wrong? No idea what went wrong. Okay. Right, okay, it was probably just too many files in one go. All right, so this is our first working version. Uh, this is not going to be the last commit because we still have to upload it to the workshop and that will make changes to uh, files right here. So for example, the description. So um, press the corners of the module in the correct order. Um, I, I, I guess that's good enough. Um, the correct solution is right around the corner.
that's actually the flavor text in the um, manual. So, so yeah. All right, let's recompile that so that the uh, uh, manual which we just copied is uh, that the PDF is is in it. And then let's run the uh, workshop script. Um, all right, there you go. Corners, uh, clickety click. So first working version. Uh, this obviously will not show in the announcements channel because the announcements channel will show this when a module is not new. So I'm going to click this and I'm going to copy and paste this uh, um, number. Let's save this as corners.json and change the number right here. I don't care about the symbol anymore and there's no tutorial video. It doesn't have Twitch Play support yet, so I guess I'm going to have to add that. Uh, diffuser difficulty easy, expert easy. In fact, diffuser I'm going to say very easy. Uh, description, uh, press the corners of the modules in the correct order. Tags, uh, colors, corners, uh, module corners, I guess. Um, Status light centered. Uh, so um, it doesn't need an ignore list. Uh, the module ID is corners module. The name is corners. The uh, published date is 2019-1103. Corners, uh, GitHub, contain corners. That doesn't exist yet, but I'm going to create that. Uh, considered, uh, explain. Right, let, let's find me another JSON file because I, I don't quite remember the exact format here. Uh, it's called explanation. See, I, I would have gotten it wrong. Uh, souvenir could ask what the colors of the corners were. They disappear, unsolve. All right. So that's that. All right, let's 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 add uh, Twitch base support because that's going to be really easy. Um, the corners are in clockwise order, right? In the um, in this array here, top left. Yep, that's clockwise order. OK, so uh, let's go to any other module, such as, for example, uh, odd one out. Find the Twitch command processor. Let's copy this stuff. Go to here. Um, copy this. Um, the help message, right? So press top left, press the top left corner, uh, chain with com uh, chaining possible. It doesn't matter if you use commas or spaces or whatever. And we're also going to need to add a uh, colorblind mode, I just realized. So actually, I'm going to do the colorblind mode first. Sorry. <laughs> For that, I need a font. And uh, I tend to have my um, I tend to have my colorblind modes in different fonts on different modules. So because this module is called Corners, I'm going to find something with uh, you know a sort of blocky kind of font, something that is very cornery. Let's see if we can find something. Yeah, I don't really want that. Um, it's not black letter. Where am I talking? Um, computer, I guess. Um, uh, maybe uh, I want something just really blocky. Um, let's let's see some more here. Hmm, that's uh possible. That's possible, but no, I I don't really like this pixelated look. I really just want blocky uh letters. Let's find something here. Uh, okay. Um, groovy. All right, that's what you call groovy. Um, headline. Okay, bingo. All right, this is not blocky as I said, but this looks suitable. Oh, this looks very. Su no, actually, no, it doesn't. Um, right, let's keep looking. Ah, this one looks good. No, it doesn't. The B is out of proportion. I don't like that. Um, Hollywood, yeah, whatever. This is wonky. Uh, timeline, ooh. I like this. Uh, ooh, I like this one even more. Ah, but that's Star Wars themed. I don't want that to uh, 
Okay, so let's take a look at the capital letters here. Blue, yellow, red. I think this this is suitable. What about this one? Oh, this is better. I mean, it's more suitable for this module. Blue, red, yellow, and green. Right, so for now I'm gonna go with timeline, but let's let's look at some some others. Where else? LCD. Um, that's very similar to the computers category, isn't it? Um, let's see, there's another page. Yeah, this is still not quite what I'm looking for. Um, modern. Modern, modern, modern. Modern can be basically anything, right? How is the module coming? Oh, have, have you been away? Uh, um, Xmaster. Orbitron, that looks blocky. Um, let's see what else is blocky. Uh, pointed. Oh, pointed. No, this is this is not the kind of pointed I'm looking for. Rounded. I don't want it rounded. Um, square. Oh my gosh. Okay. Ah, oh, that is much, much, much closer to what I was looking for. Let's take a look at some of these. Um, this one maybe. Um, right, this is not recognizable as a B, so I'm not going to use that. And this has uneven width. I don't like that. Um, okay, so that's pretty good. What else do we have? Various. Okay, cool. All right, so it's either this or this. Uh, I like this one the best so far. So that's blue, yellow. Right, okay, I like that one more than timeline. Let's take a look at this one. This one doesn't have capital letters, go away. Um, at the B, that does not look like a B, so I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting design, but I can't use it for this module, sorry. Uh, that's a B, Y, R, yeah, that looks a bit primitive. I'm gonna go with Orbitron. This is the one that I'm using. I have decided on a font, and I probably only need uh, one of these. Um, so I, I'm gonna put all of them. No, actually, I'm. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna put all of them in my folder. So let's go here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, since there's gonna be only one font, I'm gonna put it in MISC. So let's put them all here and then look at them. Um, that looks suitable. That looks almost the same. And that is a bit thinner and that is much thinner. So it's neither of these. Um, yeah, the black one is a bit thicker, so I'm gonna go with that. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so now we're gonna need a module, um, module, a material for this, and we're gonna use the GUI KT 3D Text Diffuse Shader. Uh, we're gonna give it the texture of the font that I just selected. So this font texture thing here, we drag that here, and then we create the. Um, uh, yeah, let's, let's put the module back into view. Now I've suddenly got something in my throat. I do apologize for that. <clears throat> okay, so the clickable areas, yeah, I think I'm just going to make it separate object. So let's just create an empty thing here. Uh, color blind top left, and this is going to have a uh, text renderer. No, it's called text mesh. Sorry, it does need a mesh renderer, which has the material, but I need to set the font first. Let's set the font to this, and then we set the material to this. The reason I did it in that order is because if you set the font, every time you set the font here, okay, it doesn't show now because I didn't change it, but uh, if I were to change it now, see, it sets the font material back to the, um, to the material of that font rather than the material that I want, which is this one. And let's put an R here, and I think we need to rotate this. That's probably the wrong rotation, but let's uh, let's change the font size to 64. Uh, change the size, and let's put it on the module, which is 0.15 and then a bit. Okay, so 90 was indeed the wrong rotation, and so is 180. So let's 90 here, no. 90 here, no. All right, negative 90, what? What's going on? Okay, I don't know why I needed to rotate it that way, but um, I don't care. 
Oh, wait a second. Maybe it's because... Wait a second. Aha, this is supposed to be bottom left, so I'm actually looking at the module in the wrong... See, this is the disadvantage of not having the status light in the corner and having the module be completely symmetric. You lose sight of which orientation you're looking at it in. So we don't want this, we want this. Right, we also want it um, centered. And we also don't want it this big. Right? It doesn't need to be this big. So uh, let's make it that big. Uh, we're also going to make it black, I guess. So um, uh, let's put it at 0 0.05. That sounds like a good number. All right. We want the color to be black, a total and complete darkness. Um, Okay, and then uh, we do a copy of this, and this is going to be the top right one, where the uh, x coordinate is positive. And then we take two copies of that, where the z coordinate is negative, and call them bottom left, bottom right, and change the order. All right, let's press apply, and let's also set. Uh, these here to sensible values. All right, apply. So now we need the text objects here. So we're going to go public text mesh uh, color blind. Um, and then we're going to assign them to this. I'm going to lock that. Um, do we have compiler errors? We do have a compiler error. Right, this doesn't, right, OK. Right, let's just fix that temporarily, just so I can add the uh, uh, text meshes to this. Where is it? Colorblind. There it is. OK, top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. That is in the correct order. Um, and then I want them initially uh, disabled. No, not this, this. I want them initially invisible. Um, and then I'm going to give this the km colorblind mode thing. Uh, add that here after rule seedable km colorblind mode colorblind mode. Uh, that one. All right. Show that. Uh, right, where did that appear? There it is. Bingo. Right. So that should be apply. And now we are going to have a Boolean to say whether colorblind mode is active. And initially, at the start of this, we're going to set this to uh, colorblind mode dot colorblind mode active. There you go. Right. And then uh, here, we're going to um, uh, colorblind uh, I. Well, actually, colorblind of this, right? Okay, so this gives us the um, you know the position, and we want to set its text to either R, G, B, or yellow because those are the colors of that. All right, and then we need to dot to string that because otherwise it's a single character. All right, and now uh, we want this to be visible. Uh, game object. Oh, right, this. Uh, game object dot uh, set active if colorblind is active. All right. Now we take a copy of this and then in the oops, I press that again in the Twitch place handler. We're now going to say uh, if um, the if the command was literally just colorblind with potential spaces around it, ignore case uh, culture invariant. If that is the case, if that is a match, then um, we set all of these game objects to true. We set colorblind to true. Uh, and then we yield break. There you go. Although we do want to yield return null because it is a valid command. But we can actually do this here so the colorblind mode gets activated slightly sooner than you know, as soon as possible, basically. All right, so that's that. Um, next, if the command is press, then we want to press it. So we need a ma match object for that. 
if uh, you know, actually, we can just do this. Uh, regex.match, we take the command. So the command can start with any number of spaces and have the word press. And then, right, so press is, uh, it, it should be optional. Um, but you can also have like press or submit or enter or um, touch is what the, mo the manual calls it, right? So let's uh, not capture these and then here we have a sequence of uh, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. The order here doesn't matter. Okay, so that gives us right, and and then uh, right, we want any number of these, but we want them to be uh, separable by uh, either a space or a comma or a semicolon or maybe even a dash, whatever, which needs to be at the start of that, and then any number of those. Uh, but at least one, so you can't sm smush them together. All right, so ignore case and uh, culture invariant. And now, if that is uh, not a match, then we can just yield break, and that's an invalid command. All right? Now, um, uh, var buttons is equal to uh, command, no, not command, we have our matched group here, don't we? We don't want to capture this one, but we do want to capture the entire outer one, which has all of it in it. Right, so that we want to split that at the following separators, minus, space, comma, or semicolon. Right, and remove empty entries, thank you. So, we split that, and then, um, uh, so the buttons, so these are the button strings, and then the buttons that we actually need to press is a list of KM selectable for, for each uh, string in the strings. Uh, let's take a look at what the lower case uh, of that is. If it is uh, TL, then we buttons add, so the top left is um, uh, corners, uh, corner, corner, click, clickable, it's clickable areas, isn't it? No, it's not. Uh, what is it? It's also not clamps. Uh, it's corners. I thought it was corners. Wasn't corners in there? It is now, of course. <laughs> All right, so we do that and then break. We have four of those. These are in the bottom. Then we have right and right, different order. Um, one, two, and three. Right, and if you put anything else, this shouldn't happen because the regular expression shouldn't have matched, but if anything else happens, we just yield break. And then we just uh, put those buttons there. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's good. Um, uh, let's test that. Uh, oh, we actually can't test the module in the test hunt. Oh, yes, we can, because I changed it. <laughs> the thing with the status lights is no longer there. All right, so let's enable Twitch Play support in the test harness, which we can do here, and then run a command. So first of all, uh, top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left is very likely wrong. And it says uh, invalid command. Okay, so that's because... Why is that? That should have been correct. Let's try it with press in front of left to right, bottom right. Okay, it still says invalid command. That's uh, very strange. Uh, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. So it has to be one of these, followed by any number of Y. Oh! See, that's why, because it will require another piece of, of this at the end, after the last one. I'm going to change this to a star, because I can't be bothered to fix this properly. So you can actually smudge them together if you want, which is not a big deal. I can close this now, and let's try this. So top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left is very likely wrong. Um, did it press them? It didn't give me a strike. 
Let's see. Oh, right. It's because I forgot to uh, uh, you'd return null when it's a valid command. There you go. Here we go. Um, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Bingo. That happened to be the correct answer by happenstance. Okay, so if I go top left, top right, and then top left again, it should strike. Bingo, it does. And if I go like top left, top right, top left, and then something else, it should uh, ignore that else. So it should just do those three and then stop when the strike happens. And if I go uh, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, this is probably the wrong answer. Yep, I'm getting a strike for that. And then the correct answer should be um, here. So the answer is... Uh, let's try other commands and let's also try uppercase, make sure that works. That seems to work. Okay, I'm happy with that. Let's uh, compile that. Okay, so that adds uh, Twitch Play support. Let's also try out the um, colorblind mode. We haven't actually tested that yet. If we turn that on, we should now see those letters, and that is correct. I think those letters are a bit big, and uh, well, they are in perfectly the right place for the... Well, maybe not perfect, but I think it's good enough. But I'm going to make them smaller, just very slightly. Um, let's change the font size to uh, uh, 54. Still looks a bit big, but I'm okay with this. Now let's 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 just let's just try it. Forty-eight. Let's see, just see. Um, yeah, I'm happier with that. Okay, let's keep it at that, and then let's see what happens when uh, colorblind mode is not initially enabled. Let's uh, apply, save, run, and enable it through Twitch Plays. That needs to work as well. One colorblind. Oops, that did not work. Okay, so that did not work. That did not work because I am setting these to, to true. Um, right, so my guess is that when I set them here... No, I am setting the string in all cases. Hmm. Ah, colorblind.gameobject.setActive. Colorblind game. No, that, that is exactly the same. So, why is it not working? Um, did I just enter the wrong command? Did I just typo it? Hmm. Uh, oops. Didn't mean to stop the game mode, the play mode. Right, one colorblind. It's broken. Uh, I don't understand why. So let's take a look at what happened here. Uh, the text. Look at this. The text object is active and the text is R. But it's not showing on the module. Why is that? That is very strange. Right, let's take a look at the scene. Oh, it shows here. Okay, it's Z fighting. A little. Um, but, 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 it's, but why is it not showing here? Oh, it's showing in... Wow! Ah, there you go. It is actually Z fighting. Okay, that means that 15001 is too close to the module. Let's make it just 01 like that. All right, apply, save. Uh, weird, it shows in the upper right window. Yep. And by now you will have. By the time I've read that, you will have seen uh, the, the answer. So color blind and bang, it works. All right. Blink, 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 blink. It's actually top right, bottom right. Ta da! I just realized something that if you start, if you if you get a strike and this. Um, uh, curl routine here starts, and within that one second, you actually solve the entire module. 
um, yeah, we then we, we shouldn't change the color too. So if the module has been solved by then, uh, then just you'll break that. Because that would be uh, dumb if it changes the LEDs uh, to something other than green when it's already solved. I think we're done. So let's upload that. Um, added Twitch plays support and colorblind mode. I guess that doesn't need to be uh, capitalized. All right, so let's upload that. And did we finish our JSON for this? Oh, the Twitch plays, right. What do you think the score on Twitch plays should be? I think this is a really simple module, but you, you still need to do some work because you need to find the lowest, you know, the, the shortest path. So I think like, maybe four or five. What do you guys think? I I'm going to put four. Um, if you have any objections to that, if you think it should be more or even less, then please let me know. Um, let's close that. All right. And now I'm going to close Unity. And I'm going to run Katane Web. That would break Souvenir. What would break souvenir? Colorblind. Oh, colorblind stays off the solve. Thank you. You are absolutely correct. We need to remove the colorblind uh, objects when when it's solved. So, um, uh, right. Turn status lights off. No, that's that's when when you get a strike. So here, at handle handle pass. Where is it? Am I? Uh, it says green here, so it must be here. Uh, that's where it is. Handle pass. Okay, so I guess I'll just do this. Colorblind J game of J set active false. Um, you know, actually, just to make sure, you know, that it doesn't accidentally reappear like through two space or something. Let's actually let's actually set the text uh, to empty as well as removing it. So there we go. Right, thank you for noticing that, uh, Mr. Peanut. Okay, so in our Katain web thing, oops, come on, in our Katain web thing here, I guess we can uh, upload all of this now, because uh, the manual's not going to change anymore. The JSON we've uh, put the uh, Twitch place thing in, so that's fine. Um, oh yeah, that's right. I wanted to run uh, Katane Web to reformat that JSON file because uh, you know I like to keep it all consistent. So while that is waiting, I suppose I can upload this again with the newest fix. And now it's running. So let's go here. I meant this. Close the fonts because I don't need those anymore. And now you will see that the JSON file will have been reformatted. Yay, bingo. OK, so corners uh, module. That is now live on the website. And you cannot subscribe to, oh, it's not because I forgot to do a pull first, uh, which means that I now have to do a rebase, which is fine. Let's just rebase here. All right. So let's push that. So now it's live on the website. But of course, the Steam Workshop item is still uh, private, so you can't subscribe to it yet. And of course, this number here is missing. Like, uh, we already knew that that bug always happens. So let's do that. Uh, TP support, color. Oh, no, it's, I already did that, right? Uh, color blind fix. Um, let me go to my own Steam Workshop. Um, let's go to uh, Tim Wee. Um, no, it's actually here, isn't it? Your files, files you've posted. Uh, there you go, corners. Aha! It doesn't have the... Oop! It does have the preview. Okay, yeah, I already uploaded color by most of it. Just call it a fix. There you go. Um, PogChamp. Hey, strike! All right, there you go. Okay, so now I can make this uh, um, module visible. Um, so I'm going to go, uh, ah, uh, this module was actually invented originally by uh, Pruse. So I guess I'm going to add him as a contributor. 
Mm, apparently I don't have him in my friends list. I guess I'll do that later. But I really should do that here. Because I have author Tim Wee, but I should definitely credit Bruce for the original idea there. So um, that was a bit of an oversight, and I uh, apologize if Bruce is watching. Credit Bruce. And then we basically hit two. So let's just combine the last two changes into one. So, uh, and then get push minus F. Whoops, minus F. Thank you. Okay, so that should fix that. Done. Um, okay, uh, I don't need contain web anymore. I guess I can go back to corners SLN. Uh, what else did I need to do? I I uploaded this. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to make it public. That's what I wanted to do. Change visibility public. All right. We've created the entire module from start to finish. Uh, we've uploaded the manual. Oh my gosh, I forgot. Um, it has rule seed support. Uh, and uh, divided squares doesn't. So I'm going to have to uh, add this rule seed support. There you go. I want to add that. All right, let's go back to Kitane Web, run that. Let's do that. And then, bingo, rule seed support. And let's do this again. All right, so we're just uh, squashing these changes so that we uh, end up getting only one extra change for, for this module rather than three. OK, thank you. Exit. OK, so now Corners module has a JSON, which has rule seed support right there in it. All right, we're, we're done, ladies and gentlemen. We can now go to the uh, Katain website. And Corners is now listed on the top. Um, and in case you're curious, um, that is my 65th module now. Um, it, including modules that I don't really consider to be my own, like uh, lasers and stuff. So I guess it's 65 modules that I've been credited for. Let's put it that way. All right. Is there anything else that I need to do that I've forgotten? Uh, yes, there is. I have not actually uploaded the uh, newest version of the source code to GitHub. So we have uh, Twitch Play support, colorblind mode, um, yeah, that's it. Let's add that. Uh, TP support and colorblind mode. All right, so now let's go to GitHub where we create a new repository. New repository. Uh, call it Katain Corners. Um, a module for uh, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes uh, created by Tim Wee. Create that and copy this and put that in here. That is now my default remote. OK, OK, push, done. Oh yeah, I do want to push to the master branch, please. Remote branch. It doesn't have a remote branch. Well, let's just push it. Let's see what happens. OK, it'll take a while because obviously it needs to upload all of the data which in this case means uh, pretty close to uh, 15 megabytes. Well, it shouldn't take that long, but it's um, still 15 megabytes. There you go, it's done. Now if I refresh this page, uh, we will actually see that I made two commits, the first working version and the TP support and the colorblind mode. All right, so the next thing to do on this module obviously would be souvenir support, but I'm going to do that along with uh, you know, I'm not going to do that yet because I'm not going to publish it yet anyway because I only publish souvenir supports in sort of big bunches. So I'm just going to bunch it in with the next time that, you know, uh, someone creates like 20 souvenir supports. All right. So with that done, we now have corners on the actual website. I can change the rule seed to anything I want. We can look at the manual and it has rule seed. And I can go back to rule seed one and change it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. All right, I'm having a little too much fun with this. So I guess I'm done. So if anything else is missing, um, then I guess I'll have to do that another time because this is going to be where I'm going to put an end to this stream. I am tempted to do another stream another time.
uh, because I'm tempted to go back into Catane modding. I realize I haven't done it in a while. So if you have any uh, suggestions, you know, this was a, an idea created by Prus, which is published on this Catane uh, Ideas website. So if there is a, a module idea that you think you might really, really like and you think I could uh, create on a live stream and you might be interested in seeing, then feel free to uh, drop me a line either on Discord and besides that, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or suggestions, of course, you can contact me on Discord um, easily uh, or leave a comment in the YouTube section if you watch this on YouTube later. So thank you very much for watching and I hope you will enjoy my new module. <laughs>